everyone. Um, welcome to the first episode of uh, Game Funding Bootcamp, uh, co-presented uh, by SGA and a number of our uh, partners and supporters. Um, I'm really, my name is Reda Bobic. Uh, I'm the program uh, director at SGA, and it's really a great pleasure uh, to join you all and also our uh, amazing speakers that we have uh, grouped for uh, today. Um, as you all know, our first uh, topic, the topic of our first module is publishing. So uh, we'll be talking uh, both about the PC core aspect and the mobile aspect. So we are expecting today's program to last um, roughly around two hours. It might be a bit more as well, depending on your uh, Q&As. Uh, and just before we start, I'd like to mention that uh, the partners who are um, supporting and taking directly part in the program, uh, specifically today, are uh, Epic Games and, of course, uh, Three Lateral from uh, Novi Sad. So we have uh, Rocco Scandizo here and Adam Kovac. Um, then also, on the other uh, hand, later on, we'll be joined by uh, Vrinda from uh, Voodoo, one of the best-known hyper-casual pub uh, mobile publishers from uh, France and uh, Nemanja from Tami Games, who is um, uh, actively collaborating with them. And also in this uh, first part of the program, uh, we're gonna hear from Nana Tomic from uh, Madhead Games and Igor Simic from, uh, from Demagogue Studio. So there's really, I think, uh, a, a lot of good uh, material uh, ahead of us. Uh, the program is also supported by um, other partners of SGA, such as uh, Karanovic and Partners Law Office, Deloitte Serbia, and also uh, the Help Serbia organization through their uh, Reconomy project. So I think that would be it for the uh, official uh, intros. So uh, for the first part, uh, we're going to first hear uh, from uh, Rocco. Uh, then we're going to do uh, two short uh, Q&As with uh, Nenad and uh, Igor about their um, experiences in uh, working with uh, different publishers. And I would just like to mention that Madhead Games had also experience in the core domain, but also the casual domain. So uh, it might be relevant for uh, both uh, um, uh, parts of today's program. And then as a kind of a cherry on top, uh, Adam Kovac will present the Epic's Mega Grants uh, program, which is not uh, specifically a, a publishing thing, but as we have Epic on board today, uh, it was, uh, I think, a good occasion to uh, also uh, share this information. So without further ado, uh, Rocco, thanks for being with us uh, here today. Uh, the floor is yours. And uh, then, of course, uh, everyone uh, can also ask questions in the uh, Q&A. Um, uh, actually, do we have a Q&A? We don't have a Q&A here, but so you can do it in the chat uh, because we're on a meeting and not on a webinar. So Rocco, thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the intro and uh, great to meet you all. Uh, I'm going to apologize ahead of time for two things. One, my delivery of conversations via Zoom is just not the best. I much prefer to do these things in person. Uh, the second thing is like my presentation that I'm going to show, I think is essential and I kept it essential. It's going to look a bit dry, but I think it's going to have all the information we need in there. So I'm going to try to share my screen and hopefully I'm not going to share any confidential information by mistake here. Uh, let's go share. Um, okay, so you guys should be saying all on pitching. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. It's, it's going to be a very simple conversation about some of the most important basic rules that it comes down to when you are talking to an investor or a publisher about the project you want to work with them on. And uh, the fortunate thing that actually I think the developers have right now going for them is that the uh, it, we are living right now in a world where people do want more content and where for once the um, and after a very long time I feel like the power has shifted a bit more towards the talent that actually is creating games rather than being with the people who at the time were funding them that said you still have to have uh, an open mind and realize that when you're talking to what will end up being your partners for quite a considerable amount of time, you need to make sure you put your best foot forward, not only with them, but also with yourself. 
So I'm going to jump, the, actually, like last but not least, just a quick introduce it to myself. I run business development for Unreal Engine uh, in, um, in the EMEA and CIS region. Uh, we, uh, we have a team that actually is deployed across the whole region. If you have any questions for me, you can always hit me up on my email, which is rocco.scandizzo at epicgames.com. And uh, if I'm the right, not, not the right person to talk to, I can find the right person either in the team that I work with or in the other teams that we work with at Epic. So let's move along from there. First things to, let's see if it moves. Okay, it didn't move, great. So first thing to keep in mind, nobody likes the term selling many times because people think about TV shows, about car salesmen and whatnot. But when you are pitching, you are selling an idea. And it's really not, as I said, you're not selling a car, you're not selling a watch, you're not showing up with your jacket saying, if you don't like this watch, how about all these other watches that I've got? That's really not what you're doing. You're really, however, trying to make an effort in making sure that the person or the people that you're talking to really understand the project you are putting in front of them. And that's not that easy because many times games are a lot more complicated than they seem. And so you have to find a way typically in a very short amount of time to make people realize what is going on. So first things first is understanding that you are selling an idea one way or the other. You're selling to, and you're doing that within a time constraint. So when you think about your team, the first thing you should really think about who is the best person to deliver this vision. And sometimes the, the best person is a creative person who created the actual vision. Sometimes it's, his, uh, it's a team of two made of like this creative person and maybe is the producer or sometimes it's somebody else who you might have not expected to be the right person, but that's something you should really think about. Who is that person and how well they can articulate everything about the project? Generally speaking, it's always better to have one person doing the talking and the other people there to really just kind of support them. So that's your first thing to keep in mind. The second part is to really think about what goes into an effective pitch. And this also will seem something as, I even say like tautological, like obvious. The reality is many, like so many times, so, ma so many times I have personally seen, um, and it has happened like across the board, that there are lots of pitches that lack something for one reason or the other. And uh, many times that can be the kiss of death. And we'll get to the reason why that could be the kiss of death later. But so let's look at the elements. So you have to have a well, a well thought out, articul articulated, and scoped out idea in a clear and concise written presentation. Okay. So basically, what's that saying is that know what you're pitching and have that clear, like really think about how you're delivering that in a short, in a short and understandable time frame. Second, you need to have great concept art and or in engine art. Third, animation, videos and engine, and obviously playable demo. So as you see, as the more you go down, the more it's about the assets that demonstrate that you can actually get things done. Okay, so let's talk about the curve. Now, some people might be in disagreement on this, but this is kind of more or less how I see it. You see on the x-axis, you can see experience. And on the y-axis, you can see assets. Basically, the more experience you have, the less assets you need to show to demonstrate to like they can't pre pretty much gain trust with, uh, with your partners. It's, uh, it brings you to kind of think about it this way. So you've seen all, or you might have heard of venture capitalist firms giving like a 20, $30 million to just two dudes with a PowerPoint presentation. Now, typically those two dudes have had multiple exits before. And by exits, I mean, they created companies which they then sold to somebody for, a, for quite a lot of money. So when they show up with an idea, they're considered to have, they have such a veteran status that whatever idea they have, people are willing to give them money. And that's kind of like farther down here, you can just see two exit dudes versus the PPT. You can then look at this white line that shows battle tested team versus tech demo. Okay, so if you've got a battle, you've got an experienced team 
but they they've been around for a while. Maybe if there there's some gel to the team, they've worked together for a few years or shipped the product. Now they still are going to have to show something, right? They uh, they they will pretty much gather more or less the same kind of um, negotiation power as the two exit dudes would get, but they would have to get essentially more stuff in front of their investors and continuing same in, dire- in the same direction. You get to the red. Um, line that kind of really talks about imagine you're a student project you just came out of um, computer science you put together a small team you created a little project you're putting in front of publishers now you really need to showcase what you what what you want to do here in order to get people excited and to get that first fun going and obviously the more if you move this line over essentially you're getting more negotiation power so let's go back to the two exit dudes who got some real money with uh, with a PowerPoint. Now, if they actually put in the effort to get to a tech demo, they get even more negotiation power, which means they might be able to get more money or they might better get better terms. Now, the sad thing about this is that if you're a student project and you have pretty much zero experience, chances are, now there's always exceptions to confirm the room, but chances are that whatever amount of, uh, of assets you put together, your your decision your negotiation power is not going to increase. So there's a moment where you're better off at a certain point thinking about not not continuing to like try to generate more assets to get more negotiation power because it's just there's no kind of like good returns for you there. Okay, moving on to the next. So as you are looking at there's a variety of ways people look at this. And uh, the, the best way, to, the way I really like is to think about three pillars. One, the first one is what's the fantasy that you're trying to fulfill? You're, when you try to pitch a game and when you're trying to create your game in your mind and then put it in front of people who have not been through this whole creative process with you and who will need to understand what you wanna do in a very short amount of time, it really comes down to, in my mind, what's the fantasy that you want them to live? Many companies have their own ways of doing it. I think that everybody's read about the famous uh, EA uh, thing where they would call it, what's the X of the game? I personally like the idea, what's the fantasy of the game? And what's the fantasy is really like, when the, when the player is sitting in front of, of that screen, of that TV, or putting on a VR headset, or they're in front of their computer, what essentially are they, what kind of clothes are they wearing? What, like, what, what kind of like mask are they putting on? How, what kind of world are they getting into? What is the essential thing that, they, that you are making them do that they could not do in reality? So a way to really think about it is if you look at a variety of like out, games out there, you can think about what is the fantasy that they're really trying to sell you in each one of these games? What, are, what do you get to do that you couldn't do normally? So for me in Ghost of Tsushima, personally, uh, I'm a big fan of, of, uh, of uh, feudal Japanese lore. I was like, okay, great. I get to be a samurai in feudal Japan. And that's just like in an open world with a, a story-based setting and with like, infinite amounts of beautiful places to, to, to explore. But the basic gist of it is that I get to be a samurai. In Among Us, I get to be, like, I actually get to be a bit of a bastard. I actually get to like go out there and really kind of uh, mess around with people in a fun way. I like to get, I get the whole kind of like trader angle going and I really like it. Uh, in Valheim, personally, the, the fantasy that really so, like sold me, for me, that was almost like a horror game. So if, uh, if somebody is explaining to me, I, it's like, this is a survival, it's like almost like a survival horror game, but in, in the Norse mythology. And with uh, Hot Wheels, it, for me, the fantasy was being able to play the biggest Hot Wheels sets you could ever imagine they could, that I'll never be able to build uh, and, and be able to race on them. So it's really about finding a way for you, and everybody's going to have their own way of like seeing the fantasy in each one of these games, but it's really a way for you to think about in your game, simply speaking, without going into too much detail or theory, what is the fantasy yourself? The second part of this is your motivation. 
Uh, why do you really want to make this game? And it's important to sell the motivation because making a game takes time. And there's a lot of, uh, of energy, a lot of mental energy, and a lot of uh, endurance that have to go into the process. So when you're talking to somebody who wants to essentially partner with you for a significant amount of your life, we're talking about two years, three years, four years, you need to really show that you're motivated to make this game. And you need to show it to yourself too. I mean, that's the reality of the fact you need to really kind of think about why am I making this game? Why am I motivated to make this fantastic game? Why am I seeking this partner to make this game? Here's why I want to do that. And the third part is the more, call it academic financial part, which is what's the plan. So I have my fantasy, I have my motivation, and I have a plan to make these things happen. And that's a nice slide typically about your staffing plan, how many people you're going to have doing what, why you need why you need eight engineers versus four, four like four uh, animators versus two technical artists. You need to have all that in there, and clearly and clearly tabled out so people can understand exactly who's going to be doing what. And ideally, you can be able to explain it. So that brings to the most important point, which is why can you get it done? Um, most of the time, when you're looking at a team, you really want to have, call it the, they try the what in like in MMOs and most RPGs that triumvirate of DPS tank heals, which is for me, creative tech and management. You need to have an extremely inspired creative person in the room who can talk to you about the vision of the game, you need to have the tech guy who can like explain how he's going to get that vision made. And you need to have management to who's going to be a bridge between the two to make sure that neither, neither of the two go out of completely out of control one direction or the other, and who can essentially kind of represent the production, get things done part, part of, the, of the project. And this is why, and I want to really make this very clear, I'm implying it a bit all over the place, most games, the biggest killer of pitches and most games get canceled when people lose confidence that they can be done. So if somebody is confident that a game can be done, if you manage to portray confidence in getting the game to the finish line, you, your pitch is most probably successful. Might not be successful with one that specific partner, but some partner out there is going to be right for you. If you don't have that confidence, if you can't portray it, it's going to kill your pitch. Okay, so we, we're going to move on to the, the metaverse word. Uh, this has come up quite a lot, uh, especially recently. Um, keep in mind, this is my opinion. It's not the company's opinion. It's not official opinion. It's, uh, it's something that's actually forming as, as we go. Uh, but a lot of people ask, like, how, how can I uh, change my project or uh is uh, to be part of a metaverse or is my project something that is metaverse -y, or is my company something that's metaverse -y? uh the way i see it is most projects can actually in one way or the other partake in the growth of the metaverse and the, and the essentially all these trends that are bringing towards what the future of the metaverse will be one way or the other and the on one side you could really think about games that are part that can be part of the metaverse and by part of the metaverse uh, emphasis on part and the other part is like games that can be experienced through the metaverse so emphasis on through so the ones that are more strongly part of the metaverse if you imagine a company or you imagine a project like a spider spider chart for each one of these where you really look about at the key features of the metaverse which are realism ubiquity, scalability, and interoperability. Essentially, if you scale high or decently on one or more than these, your game is already starting to build probably something of a proto-metaverse proto one way or the other. And you're definitely like closer to what's probably going to be one of the final representations. So examples of this are 
Fortnite, obviously Roblox and Minecraft. If you really look at, let's give an example of Roblox. So from a realism point of view, Roblox is not realistic, but it's realistic enough that people feel that they actually can invest emotionally in the game. Ubiquity, you can play the game from quite a lot of machines, but not from everywhere. So it's like, it has a decent scale, decent like points there, but it's not full scale. Scalability, it's also something that it's, it's getting there. You can actually do all the, like a variety of things in the game. It's actually scalable across different uh, machines and the processing power as you do it, get everything done is not uh, out of control. So I would say good points, not final, not final destination. Interoperability is probably where everybody's suffering right now. So that's something where I think the whole, the whole, the whole industry needs to kind of come closer together. But essentially, you see it, it, scare, it scores well enough on a certain amount of that. So it feels that it is part of the metaverse or it has its own form of metaverse. So things that these games have in common or these kind of games have is that there's a lot of social interactions and or there's a free to play model and or there's a game to service model and or there's a multiplayer and or open world. So if you see all of these characteristics, more, more or less, if you fall within those categories, you are probably more, more cl closer to having some of those features in play. Now, I want to kind of focus on the first one, though, the one that I think is also like very important, which is a social interactions one. Um, because that kind of speaks to the games that can be experienced as fruit of, merit, fruit of metaverse. Uh, so, and I think that also adds to certain ways of looking at multiplayer, because not all multiplayer is versus multiplayer or is more co-op multiplayer. There's various ways for people to interact with, with each other in a way that could be almost considered like a like multiplayer, but by simply, simply getting them to interact with each other through the game that they're playing. So when you think about stuff that can be seen through the metaverse, think about how so many games out there have created ways for people to interact, even if they're single player games. And I'm gonna give, throw out a couple of examples there, but so Telltale's The Walking Dead is a very good example of a game that is essentially a, single, a very story-driven single player game, but they found ways for, to create discourse and interactions between the players by sharing their decisions at the end of, like your decisions versus the other people's decisions at the end of the game. Let's add in like, let's as another example, Game of Thrones. So Game of Thrones released on a weekly basis, right? So between episodes, there was this whole time frame where people could go normally on social media, but also ideally in real life, have conversations about the show, share their, their, their theories about who was gonna die next, what was going to happen. The people who had already read the book would like actually have fun kind of just listening to, People think about what's going to happen next, but that time frame between the shows was extremely important for the show to create a community. If if Game of, I, my theory here is that Game of Thrones had been released as a binge watchable show all at the same time, the success level would have been extremely different, and it would have not enjoyed that extreme level of hype that was happening between one episode and the next, where the shock value would have not worked in its favor that much. So I think that's very important to think about how you can use the social connotations that will come through the metaverse to increase the value of your games and how your games can really int make int players interact with each other. Okay, so we're pretty much towards the end here. Um, and here's a bit of advice crumbles. So the first one is be true to, to your vision. Uh, that's that's extremely important. The, and some of these things might actually sound like platitudes and trite, but they're not. The reality is, is like you really need to be true to your vision. Your vision has to be pure. You need to be in love with it. And when you're in love with your vision and you really believe in it, it will come through. As long as your, as we said before, your presentation is concise, you're very clear in explaining it, like the fantasy you're selling, and you have all your ducks in a row. So the second one is, second little crumble here is sell your art with concept art and really good art. Now that's really important 
so, there's so many times you see presentations that are exactly like mine. There's no art in them. Now, it's one thing for me to do a dry presentation about pitching because I'm not pitching a, a game to you guys, but if you are delivering a fantasy, people will want to see the art style, the world that they will have to, they won't want to have the form of like, um, uh, they will want to know the texture of what you are envisioning. And art delivers a lot of that texture. Okay, stories need to include the twist and the ending. This one happens all the time. Somebody shows up, they have a story-based game. It might be an open world game. It might be a single player game, but they, it has a story. And during the pitch, they will tell you, well, we got like, oh, here's this is what's this, the setup. And then the hero uh, uh, discovers something. And then at the ending, there's a twist. And I'm not going to tell, and, uh, and it's going to like change the whole way people like think about it. And it's going to be so great. And so the first answer the question, like the publisher or the investor will ask it like, so what's the, what's the ending? And the developer will say, well, I can't tell you. Okay, that is a big no-no. That should never happen. You should tell the ending to your. If there's a big twist, if there's a if there's a surprise ending, you need to tell it. <laughs> it's just gonna have to happen. Um, this is especially if you're in like on the curve of, of of experience. You're like on the on the shorter side. If you have a ton of experience, you can probably get away with a lot more. But if you're on the shorter side, do tell your story. Okay, be detailed where it matters. This is a really about thinking of your core loop or if there's some specific mechanics you really want to explain because they might be more creative, they might be different than some of the tropes you see out there on the market. You might be breaking the mold on something. And so if you feel like there's some, there, are, there are parts of your game that are difficult for people to understand and to catch, go into detail. Use all sorts of assets you can that you can think about. Uh, from storyboarding, key art, and videos, anything, explain it. Uh, last point. Now, this also happens a lot. Don't ever get offended by feedback, even if it's offensive. But it does you no good to take feedback unkindly. Now, I've seen people deliver feedback very roughly, and I've seen people deliver feedback very nicely, and I've seen people get offended both with the nice people and with the people who are rough. So sometimes it's really about it's really about just saying like, okay, this is this is not the right project maybe for this person, but let me really learn what I can from this feedback. And if I if I'm not learning anything, let me just let it go and I'll go into the next meeting still in a good mood. Because really don't let anybody ruin your next meeting and and try to learn as much as you can from every single meeting you're taking, because that's the reality of what you really want to get out of it. If you go into a meeting and you learn something for the next pitch, you, you earn something. If you go into a meeting and you just get upset, you earn nothing and that really doesn't help you. The Moving on to the don'ts. Okay, pretty much these are a bit of the opposite of what I said on the do, but don't be overly wordly or too many slides. The, the running joke of, uh, of meetings at conventions at the last half an hour that you kind of go, it takes you five minutes. Everybody shows up five minutes late. You have to talk about, be nice for five minutes to each other, talk about like just do social interactions. That leaves you 20 minutes, at which point you've got, call it 15 minutes to go for your pitch. And then the person who needs to go to some other hotel room or some other conference rooms, who knows where in the other part of the, of the conference is going to say, sorry, I need to go to the next meeting and they're gonna run away. So you've got more or less 15 minutes. Uh, that really means you need to time yourself. So look at your slides, look how many you've got, Try to keep trim all the fat out of it and make it like sure that you are keeping things as as edited down as possible. So concept is too confusing for a buyer to get. That also can happen, and that that typically happens when there's a bit too much too much innovation sometimes. And um, too much innovation doesn't have to be a bad thing. You can always keep it in your game if it really works. But when you're selling it you might want to focus on always thinking about editing and saying, okay, I'm going to make sure that this point comes through. Uh, if I've got 15 minutes, I've got half an hour, this is the point I really want to go through. And then as the relationship unfolds, you can go into more, more complications. So really focus on something like 
if there is going to be something that needs more explanation, pick one and then make the rest of the comps that really live around that core thing. And then later on, add the extra layers as you get farther into the relationship and you have more time to explain and, uh, and let people be inspired by the innovation you want to bring in. Too many voices in the room. This happens a lot too, where, and I've seen this personally, where somebody's pitching, their colleague isn't agreeing with how they're pitching, interrupts them, say like, no, no, this is how it actually works. To which the other colleague, the first one says, no, no, it works really this way. Then they start arguing with each other and you spend the rest of the pitch looking at the team argue with each other about how things should work in the game. Yeah, don't make that happen. That's definitely something you want to avoid. And uh, you want, ideally, you want to have one strong voice in the room and everybody else really be there for support. But if you're tag teaming it, you can do it. Just plan it and don't bicker. I mean, don't fall into the pitfall of like not rehearsing. Um, that's really not on there, but rehearsing is very important. Talking about always the, the think about, you got 15 minutes probably, in some cases you have 30. If you rehearse your pitch, you will be able to deliver it so much better. And if you get feedback ahead of time by colleagues, by friends, by friends in the industry, you, your, the pitch you start with is probably not gonna be the pitch you end with before you actually go in front of investors. So rehearsing is something that I strongly recommend. Um, too much telling and not showing enough. That always goes back to the assets. You can tell as much of the story you want, but if you're not on the right point of that curve, if you're not that veteran team, you need a lot of assets. So think about that curve and where you are and think about what you really need to put in front to, uh, to get people excited. Not effectively answering the questions that are being asked. Okay, this is also a... Uh, a big no-no. This kind of falls back also always into the people start losing trust so you'll be able to finish stuff. If somebody's asking you a very specific question, you either answer it directly or you say, I need to get back to you. This is something that you made, you, you gave me really something to think about. Let me think about it and get back to you. Don't try to mumbo jumbo it. Let's put it exactly that way. Ob obvious tack-ons. So obvious tack-ons are when, uh, Back in the day, there's attack ons of like, oh, you got a single player, you got a great single player game, but you know you need multiplayer. And so people would tack on a multiplayer just to, just to say like, oh, we've got that thing added in there. Uh, right now, there's a lot of tacking on NFTs. So the basic advice I have is to always make sure that if there's some of these, if you're working with some of these more uh, of these items that are hot or that in some case, some people consider them must haves, Make sure that they're really part of your concept and that you're really passionate about it. Because if you're just a tack on or something like an extra slide that gets thrown in there because it has to be had, it does kind of show. And at the end of the day, you might not be happy with the tack on either, which will probably like ruin your relationship with this game that's going to be your long, a long term project for you. And we're, we're pretty much at the end of the, of the presentation. And um, I wonder if anybody uh, has any questions. Yeah, I, I'm just gonna jump in uh, briefly with one or two questions and then I'll uh, hand it over to the, to, to the audience. So uh, thanks a lot. It's great to, uh, to also focus on this uh, side of the pitching. And what do you think uh, now during the pandemic this whole process, uh, was it like completely stalled or, uh, you know, ju just from your own experience, from your colleagues from the industry, uh, how do you pitch when there's no events, when there are no pitching events, when there are no physical conferences? So I think what, what happened during uh, the pandemic is that everybody who had been working a lot in, in creating their network, um was able to continue doing uh bd activity for quite some time the uh the networks even as we did not meet in person were like where people had enough trust and had met with partners and kind of knew uh, a bit more what they were about and there was a bit more of that personal experience those have resisted in a more robust way to the distance 
the people who have been less fortunate are those who are like probably at the beginning stages of, of their of their career had fewer had less uh, in person experience. So I have to say that um, I think that the, the most of the strain fell on the less experienced teams. And uh, to that point, we we've actually tried to put in place more more efforts, Stephen, on our side to help out less experienced teams with competitions, what not to get the visibility necessary to kind of help them break through. But other than that, I think that Zoom um, did a good bridging and, and, other, and other tools for video conferencing have done a good, have been like very useful in bridging the, the gap of not being able to do at conferences. I've seen, everybody's seen the amount of, of deals getting negotiated in the last two years. Um, and so I think that the, there definitely has been, uh, uh, it hasn't been as hard as we were all fearing. Okay, thanks. My second question would come kind of before, um, in a way, before the start of your presentation. Uh, so obviously we're talking about publishing today. We're going to have a separate module on investments uh, in early April. And we're also going to have a practical workshop on, on pitching and negotiating uh, on April 19th in Belgrade. But uh, before you go pitching to a publisher, uh, what would you say, when do you decide, how do you decide that you want to go to a publisher? Uh, do you go before you have uh, a prototype or after or um, once your game has already been self-published by you and so on, we're, we're going to hear probably different uh, cases from Nana and Igor later on, but what would be your kind of take on it? Well, so it, it really, if you're looking for a publishing deal, typically you're better off, um, the more assets you have and the, uh, the farther from release you are from a certain point of view, like the, so you're kind of like, the more assets you have means you're getting closer to release, but you don't want the game released. So you want to have like the, the publisher enough time to actually be effective at their job, right? So there is that time frame where the more assets you have, um, the more negotiation power you have, the more the, the publisher will be able to be like to understand the project you're really creating, the more, the more they'll be able to understand if you're the right partner for them. And at the same time, if for you to understand if they're, they're the right partner for you. And the, the farther away, the more time you give them to be really effective and be a good partner for you. So that's, it really depends on your project and where you're at, but and it also obviously depends on the level of funding you have and uh, and where you are financially, because many times uh, you find yourself in a point where there's an optimal point to find a publisher. And depending on the how healthy the developer is from a financial point of view, that time might end up like being put against a situation where we're running out of money. More developers who have instead already released projects or maybe have a bit more of a, of a, um, of a funnel from a financial point of view, they have a lot longer time frame to get things done and I have a lot more liberty in doing their negotiations. So it is a moving target that's based on those two sides of it, where you are with your with your pitch, with your pitch, with your resources, with your if you're actually developing the game already, uh, versus where you are financially. Okay, thanks a lot. So I would invite uh, anyone uh, from the audience, feel free to turn on your camera and mic. And uh, I would say you have a, a more or less unique uh, opportunity to, uh, to, to talk to Rocco and uh, ask him anything in relation to the presentation or maybe wider than that. Okay, hi. Hi Rocco, hi everyone. My name is Pavla. I come from the ITC studio in Serbia niche. I have a question regarding the pitch or the presentation. Uh, the One of the first things you said or one of the first advices you gave us was usually the presentation should be done by one person, right? When it's live or something like that. Do you think that still applies when it is a video? So it's a three to five video with it. We record and we plan to do it specifically in a studio so we can represent the really um, that we're really invested in, in in the idea and in the project do you think that it is better maybe to have more people in the video or 
all the funders in the video so they can explain like the holy trilogy can do i the tech guy will do the tech thing the art guy is going to do the art thing and the manager the guy is going to do the management thing or does that still apply for the recorded videos like one guy does it all what do you think in your opinion is the better so i guess it depends on how uh... so first of all pleased to meet you uh but second uh I guess it depends on how you think your, your team can deliver. So one of the main reasons to say you should have one person in the room speaking is just to keep things simple. Uh, but I can imagine a nice pitch with multiple people talking on video and explaining their specific slice of the concept. Now, are they doing like, I'll turn that question around to you a bit of saying like, are they doing that well? When you, when you look at it, do like, does everybody have the same level of, um how you say that can be portrayed the right amount of charisma in front of the screen some people work really well on video some other people work well live on video but those same people might actually work horribly on recorded video so it, it's a bit of a question for you depending on what the final asset you want to put out there um but the thing that stays is that make sure that the whatever the product is make sure that you're really in service of the game and not in service of giving everybody airtime. That's the most important yeah, thing yeah. because that's really where you want it. And, and by the way, if you ever want to uh, share the pitch with me just for feedback, I'm happy to look at any pitches. As usual, my, my email is rocco.scandito at epicgames.com. So happy to look at the pitch at, at any time if you want me to check it out. Okay, awesome. Thank you for the answer. Thank you for the opportunity. It, it does boil down to that point, right? So are they able or capable enough to, to do it correctly? So thank you for your opinion. Okay, who's next or not? There's somebody in the, in the chat. Okay, so maybe I can, I can, I can read it. Uh, okay, so the question from Uros, where can we find publishers? Do you know of a good strategy to find interested partners? Okay, so um, that's typically the biggest uh, question mark. Uh, I have to say that there's a variety at this point of conventions that will put you in a speed dating mode in front of a variety of partners. And most publishers do a good job of sending somebody to these to these events. Uh, if you don't already have a, a Rolodex, which means if you don't know, if you don't have anybody specifically from each one, each one of the target publishers, I think it's very useful to go to anything from a, uh, a games connection to the meet to matches that you'll find at a variety of, uh, of uh, game industry events left and right, the same thing at Gamescom. Uh, there's a variety of local ones, as you guys know. I strongly suggest doing that. I have spent a lot of times personally going to these uh, events and doing morning to evening meetings with developers. Some of them I knew already, a lot of them I've never heard about and seeing some fantastic projects. So I think that's, that's the key way of starting to build your network. Uh, the other way is, uh, is if you have, uh, if you, if you have like a, a very strong project, you can actually start finding partners who may be able to support you professionally on that too. But my two cents is like at least start off with really, right now you can walk the floors digitally, but later on walk the floors physically and get to meet people at these events and do as many of those meetings as you can. Okay, thanks. There's another one uh, from Lovro. Uh, from Croatia, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I run a game dev company and I get this question a lot. What's the average or max budget a student or battle tested team can expect, irrespective of the project they are working on? So I'm not sure that irrespective of the project they are working on, like it depends on the project you're working on. So I think that the, if you have a, like the, if you have a, if you're a student, it's going to be different than if you are a battle tested team. But so let's assume that you start off your career and uh, and you've just put together a small team of friends and you're looking for publishing. If your game 
is at a point where it's really presentable and really well done, you can get a significant budget. And by significant budget, you can you can definitely get seven figures. But it gets the more money you're asking for, the more it becomes difficult to get it done. The reality is you're probably looking for smaller a smaller budgets. Uh, if you're a battle tested team at this point and you've already released something, if you release something that actually even had a good Metacritic, so you your chances are that you might actually get access to a very significant budget. The reality is, is that the, the size of the budget and the kind of investment varies widely because you can get budgets for a publishing deal where the publisher will expect a certain amount of a return. You might get investment as a strategic investment from an investor who will instead like invest in your company and you'll be able to use proceeds to actually create your game. They're very different in nature. Uh, but again, they largely depend on your level of experience. And then again, on that kind of triumvirate we were talking about, how much the publisher or investor can really trust the, the tech guy, mm. the creative guy, the management guy. Rocco, is there like any, I, I understand these ranges can be really wild, but is there anything that we can say for like, student in the game developer that comes to someone with a proper vertical slice and if he's asking for 200 uh, 300,000 to get it to the next phase is that realistic or a bell tested team like what just to get a feel for i don't think we even have a feeling for what's wild what's uh, um, yeah so in short well so the the way to look at it um, so, so first of all there's a lot of it, like acquisitions have gone on that kind of have thrown old forms of metrics of like yeah. rules of thumbs out the window completely. You're like, like, you're like, oh, wow. Like I never saw that happening that way. Um, keeping that in mind, the best way to really look at what you need is really to have that, that staffing plan that is believable. And that's your backbone because you look at that, you look at the people you need to hire, you look at how many you need and how much you need to pay them. And that essentially will give you a budget. Now that budget has to be realistic. And chances are, most of the times, we underestimate these budgets by, by quite a long shot. So maybe add, add some more on top of that. And that is basically what you need to finish the game. Again, this is the reason there's no, it's always good to ask for feedback on and on, create a network and ask for feedback because once you create your budget and your scope, and you start thinking, okay, I need 500K to get say, to get this done. You might show up at a publisher and the publisher might have somebody in the room who says, that budget seems way too low. Or they might say, that budget seems way too high. Most times you see people fe fear they're asking for too much money, but lo lots of times they ask for too little. And ask the amount of money you ask for not only depends on your project sometimes, but also depends on who you're selling it to because depending on the publisher you're working for they have a different ambition profile to a certain degree and a different level of overhead and they didn't want to be able to associate um, the right amount of energy to the right amount of project almost think about it from a soccer point of view if you sell a good player to manchester united and you sell that same player to i'm not going to say another team just because they're going to feel insulted but a less important team you're probably going to get more money out of Manchester United, right? So it is a you have to really think about both the project and the partner. Thanks a lot. So we have another. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to read Lovro's uh, comment, and then we're going to do another question, and then we will have to uh, move on with the program. So Lovro says, "Thanks for the answers. I usually tend to answer that student teams." should be happy with a 75, 200K budget, even if that means accepting lower salaries for a while. It's always good to have more perspectives on this difficult question. So I actually think that like, uh, Lovro, that's a very, that's a very reasonable point. I think that uh, it makes a hundred percent sense. And it kind of like goes together with that curve we were showing before, which just says that as much assets as you have, there is a certain amount of negotiation power a, an inexperienced <laughs> team maxes out at. Uh, but I, I think your position is extremely reasonable and uh, and I think it's a very good answer. Okay, so the final question is from uh, for Rocco is from Radosh. 
Uh, do you think that concept art is a must-have? Talking about the game we are working on, we already developed a prototype version of our game that shows our core mechanics and vision, but we use assets from stores and League of Legends characters to present our idea and mechanics. What is your opinion about presenting prototype using models from other games? Is it okay or it's a no-no? I don't consider it a no-no, but I do personally, I do think that I would actually consider you to be very smart and be able to uh, demonstrate the uh, uh, pretty much the game to a certain degree through other people's assets or through marketplace assets. I think that's extremely useful. And if the marketplace assets are actually the kind that you can use in your game, even better. I do think this puts more emphasis on the need for you to have concept art that shows, however, this is just a like it shows what the vision of your game is going to look at once you roll in with your interpretation of the art though. So I think, uh, I actually think it's, you don't need to have the concept art in there or you don't have to have the characters built off of your concept art, but you do need to have the concept art for people to be able to, again, reconnecting to the fantasy, understand what the fantasy is that you're trying to deliver at the end. We missed another question in the, in the chat. Okay. So if we have another yeah, well, one more time. Uh, you want to do another one or no no there, there was no, uh, one that i think there's a missed awesome. one yep okay. uh, from um, it, it was mine i can read it if you can if you can hear me uh yeah yeah go ahead um yeah so you talked about the initial pitch so uh if we pass the initial pitch and now we are talking about concretizing the idea and like signing and lever um but uh extra proof was needed for example an extended demo um, a bigger prototype or something um are there certain no's and yeses in the industry that will help you uh finish a deal that uh, is something that you should do not on the first idea not on the first pitch but maybe at the second meeting something that will help you finalize the the agreement or something uh, that's a very tough question um and uh this is where having sometimes professional help uh, could, could like come into play. There's, there's a lot of developers who have had a very good run by using agent, a variety of different kind of like consultants or agents or, uh, or, or people who can help them with those business decisions and at those times of their negotiations. Um, and especially when you're talking about instead of selling your company, that's when you really want to have a professional from an investment bank or, or something like that really help you out. My two cents is that the requests for X, if you are down the line, if somebody's excited about closing a project, they should be able to do that in a speedy manner. It, it, it shouldn't take an inordinate amount of time. If they're putting a lot of requests in front of you for extra content, extra content, extra content, you have to pay attention because uh, they might not do that. And uh, they, they don't want to harm you, obviously, but and they, they just want to figure out how to get stuff through the door internally. But that might put you under constraint. And uh, chances are that many times as people invest more in the relationship, they feel there's a feeling that, oh, it's definitely going to go the right way. I just need to do this extra thing for them. But that's not reality. Many times you do the extra thing and then the deal doesn't happen. So I think it's important, like every time an extra request is put in front of you, that you evaluate you, you stone cold heartedly evaluate it from a business perspective and say, okay, this is gonna cost this amount of money. Is, does this make sense? Would we be doing it all the same? Is it something that actually brings the project forward in a way that makes sense to my vision, to our vision, rather than to the partner's vision? And if so, if it's reasonable, go for it. If it's not, don't go for it. I would still ask probably whoever wants to support like is asking for this extra, uh, if if it's a small amount of thing, just one thing, but if it's a, it's a certain amount of money and time has to be spent on it, I think it's reasonable to ask that to be funded. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thanks a lot. So uh, Rocco, thanks a lot for setting aside your super valuable time. Uh, and thank I you guys. It was uh, very, very good uh, for, for everybody to hear. 
As I mentioned at the end of this program, we're going to have a practical uh, pitching workshop. And we're also going to share a video of um, another pitch related um, uh, lecture that we hosted last year. So hopefully all of these brought together will uh, will help our teams, um, um, you know, uh, extend their their skills in this direction. So feel free to to stay with us, Rocco, if you want to hear some of the uh, Serbian experiences uh, from working with publishers. So I, I would move on uh, immediately to to Nenad. Nena Tomic from uh, the CEO of Madhead Games, um, a company that is one of the, uh, let's say, pioneers uh, on, the, on the Serbian uh, game dev scene. And they've been having different experiences with different kinds of uh, publishers uh, over the years. So I would just invite Nenad to uh, kind of briefly uh, tell that part of the of the Madhead story or, or Madhead history. And then uh, also we're going to do a, a short uh, Q&A. So thanks, Nenad, for being with us today. Yeah, great to be here. Well, yeah, we, I think we can safely say that we practically built up the whole company on cooperation, co cooperation with the publisher. Uh, we started off in the casual space, working with Big Age Games, who at the time when, when this was all happening was one of the biggest uh, casual publishers in the world. Over the course of the years, we, we were practically building a company solely working with them. So we have a lot of experience there. We can talk about uh, what was well about it, what wasn't, how that actually helped us propel, where it actually stopped us a bit. So there were actually pros and cons to that, that, that cooperation. Uh, but then also, uh, as the time passed, we, also, we kind of switched towards more the core gaming when we worked with Wargaming. And finally, to finalize the, our, our route with, of working with publisher, we ended up with Koch Media, who actually ended up to be this part of the same group that, in which we have been acquired like last year. So now we're, us and our publisher are actually part of the same group. So yeah, I think from all of these three things, we can talk about all sorts of uh, uh, approaches, how, what we did, um, what went right, what went wrong. Um, in the meantime, we had a lot of pitches, so we didn't nail each and every one of those from the beginning. So yeah, we can cover all the, those experience. Okay, so, so maybe the, the first question would be um, re referring to any of those three collaborations. Uh, how did you manage to uh, to actually uh, uh, to hit it? You know, was it mostly on on conferences and events? How much, uh, let's say, personal contacts and relations um, um, had play uh, there, uh, and so on? So more like how kind of the opportunity was was uh, built up for you? Yeah, I, I think the very first one, actually, the first cooperation with Big Fish was kind of connected to a personal connection to another person who was working with the big fish. So this is something that could really help you out. And it's my personal experience that being connected is obviously, it's a cat and obvious thing, right? But being connected is super useful because whenever someone has a cooperation with a person and if there is a personal vouching about someone, you would always rather try at least to work with someone. I'm not saying that it's gonna open all the doors and just make everything super fluid, but it is actually going to give some impact and because Big public, especially big publishers, always have this huge noise of people who are approaching them, and they need some kind of filter. Imagine their emails just being spammed with offers from various developers each and every day. So personal connections here can actually play as a kind of a filter, which is going to help them like pinpoint who actually has the, the most uh, perspective in, in working with them. So this was actually our case, a friend of ours who is also in the gaming industry was working with Big Fish. So he made an introduction and then the rest was up to us to prove them that we can do it. We started from a prototype game, figure out where we do it. We uh, figure out what were the right kind of questions from them. So they had certain, this was this is connected to a question which was here in, in, the, in the chat earlier. We had to redo some things which were kind of reasonable. So we got back to the playable version of the game, redid something, and then we got accepted, like our game was accepted. And that was the beginning of a very long-term cooperation. So when we signed the first game, we practically signed 59 games afterwards. So that was, that was a pretty, pretty long, long run with them. 
Uh, with wargaming was also a similar thing. Uh, actually, an epic guy was a person who, who was an intermediary in, in those discussion. But it was also like a building of the trust, knowing what our team is capable of. So it's kind of a finding like a shorter route where someone can put the attention of a publisher towards you. So just to give you this initial burst of, of right attention. And the rest is always up to you. It's about you as, as a person who's the presenting, the company that you're presenting, and also the project that you're presenting, right? So yeah, that, those are probably the, 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 how the personal connection, connections helped us in those first, first two instances. Okay, and how about events uh, or conferences? What was that? Because from my like previous professional, let's say experience in some other fields, I kind of realized that uh, there always might be a reason to go to a conference, even if you're not that into it. Uh, but you know, maybe among the 200 people there, you will you know bump into one that you're gonna do like big things with, and you never know uh, if that person is gonna be there. You should always go to conferences. That's the, that's the rule number one. Yeah, for sure. Conferences are super useful, especially if you have a plan. So one thing that you should be super aware of is that the pe people who are uh, coming to conferences, most of the important people actually come there with their schedules already filled filled out, right? So it's, it, it is going to be very difficult to systematically approach people because they're super busy. You might be able to do that after hours when like the pitching sessions are over, when everyone is kind of relaxing at the bars, even though not everyone would be available at, at those points. So what I'm trying to say is that you need to have, a uh, it's a chicken and the egg problem. You first need to get in touch with all those people prior to the conference to secure the audience with them, right? To find the time slot where you can present those things. But before you can do that, you obviously need to reach those people. And some of these people are really difficult to reach just via email. If you just send them an email, it, it's really, really, really tough. So you, you cannot, you, you should not um, think that one conference is going to solve everything. You should start thinking about how going to the conferences is becoming your lifestyle in a way. And you, how you're systematically over time investing into going conferences, talking to people, pitching ideas, etc. So I understand that it, now it might seem like a like a tricky thing because not everyone has enough time. Because what I'm thinking is actually I mean, what I'm talking about is months and years of investment because months are passing, you know, from one conference to, to another. But that's that's just the harsh reality is that it's super hard to do something from the first try, and that you should not be putting all, all your energy in just one, one big, big effort. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, would you say like, once you, you're like, okay, the publisher is interested, is that like just the very start of the story then for you or you're like halfway there or you're like, wh where are you on the roadmap of, uh, you know, actually signing a deal basically? Yeah, well, it, it really depends on the project and the publisher. So there's no one answer that can cover that. And even when it comes to the publisher, there are various levels of approval which need to happen. So you're probably talking to a biz dev person who is making his own decision and he, who is doing the initial screening of the, all the peoples from, let's say, one conference. Uh, and this is the first thing that you need to pass. If he says like, hey, I really like this, let's move, move on with this. It, what it actually means in practice that he's going to tell his boss that he likes this game. And then, then they're probably going to have another round where they go to a certain board of biz dev people who again need to green light something. And the reality is that every one of these um, green light processes is going to have some feedback attached to it and that they will want something extra. So there is going to be like their internal communication is going to take time, communication with you is going to take time. And so the overall process could even last for months. Okay. And how were you preparing yourself for negotiating, basically? Were you asking your uh, colleagues about the type of deals they have with their publishers? Or are there kind of, let's say, uh, are there like um, uh, template deals, you know, th th that are usually on the table that are kind of known across the industry? Well, yeah, I think that, that that's the thing that we used to do a, a lot. We, you could always tell a person or, or a trusted person from the industry, like, at least in some way, what you're planning to do. And there, I mean, there, there's no so many different type of deals. Like, as you said, there, there is certain kind of recipe that's going to, to work. And as 
I think it's a really good reality check if you have someone more experienced just to tell them the idea or even to practice your pitch. I, I think there's a great value, and this is what Rock also said, uh, in just practicing the pitch. And you're going to realize once you start talking to people, if you, let's say you have like 20 pitching sessions, your number 20, 19, 18 are going to be so much better than the first, second, and the third, because you're going to see uh, where you're getting the people's attention. You're going to see when this aha moment is happening. You're going to figure out which parts of your pitch you should emphasize. You're going to figure out uh, where you're losing time, where you need to be faster, slower, just remove. And so it's really a good thing that just, just be very open that your pitch is like a living thing and that you can improve upon it as, as you iterate through all these, all these discussions with various publishers. Okay. And now talking about like the process as a living thing, uh, would you say that maybe some peripheral things in the communication with the publisher or the person on the other uh, side can, can also play a role, you know, like, um, because maybe sometimes you can do everything right, but maybe too good and too kind of square, and then it doesn't leave like uh, some more uh, uh, trippy, you know, impression on, on the publisher or, or something like this. Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, telling a, a pitch, I mean, doing a pitch session is, is telling a story and there is no one right kind of way. It really comes down to what kind of person you are. And obviously, if you are a kind of person that's, I don't know, laughing and being comic about things and etc., that's who you are. And this is how you should do your pitching session. And this is how the people are going to remember you about. But that's not the only right kind of way to do it. And this is like a marginal thing. This is really something that's part of who you, who you are as a person. On the other hand, you can be, you know, a very stone cold businessy kind of person, but still, you know, giving the confidence that this is the person who can get, you know, the job done, et cetera. So yeah, I, I think all of these things are adding up in a certain way, but you need to be true to the story that you're telling and not trying to act as something as you're not. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's going to show. And I, I think if you, if you invest more time in what you're good at, I mean, in, in, from on one part, like being funny or being super serious, you're actually going to do that really, really well. Imagine, a, you know, an unfunny person trying to be funny. Like that's a complete recipe for disaster, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So now in hindsight, um, how well you in a way answered this question in the very start, but how, how do you see these different publisher um, um, collaborations, um, uh, their role in the development of, of Madhead Games as a company that's been running, you know, 10 plus years? Um, and uh, would you kind of uh, prefer to have done anything any other way, self published um, at certain point, or, you know, anything along those lines? Yeah, well, it, it's really hard to say. I'm always asking myself the same question, like what would happen if we did the other way around? And given that I'm pretty happy with, with my life at this point, I'm not convinced that I would like to necessarily think about different direction. Um, but, you know, in, in, in a very short version, the important thing when working with a publisher is just figuring out what you need from them. And publishers can give you so many different things, but you need to really figure out which one is the most important. For example, publishers can greatly de-risk the developer, right? In a way that they can invest the money. And if nothing happens with the game, the developer is still okay. Like they may be even, some of the money for development may be even left over so they can start again and they don't run off the money. And publisher is not gonna feel that super necessarily hard. So the risk is actually more on the publisher side, right? So that's, that's one thing. And it really depends on, on developer what they need. Uh, on the other hand, maybe the developers don't need any money or just need a little bit of money and they're pretty secure. So they don't need the risking, but they need visibility. This is something that if you want to do it by yourself, and as you said, by self-publishing, you need to create uh, you know, your own department with experienced people, figure out how to do, and it takes years of perfecting the, the publishing side just to make it work, not to mention the money. So it's super difficult. And this is what publisher gives you by definition, in a way, because they, they're in publishers, right? Uh, then there's also the know-how. And these are all the things that we got from the publishers. And this is why I'm my point in the, so like one was the de-risking of the process. The other ones was the reach. And then there's also know-how. 
which is not always necessarily directly directly to uh, directly connected to the publisher but it's more connected to the people within the publisher so you're not working with the publisher you're working with the people obviously and those uh, biz dev people or producers or, or whatever role there is they're going to be better or worse in, in some way. But there is going to be a, a, a very great person. If you continue do, doing that for a long, long time, eventually you're going to nail down these, these extraordinary people who are going to bring so much benefit to your own organization. Uh, you know, from their experience, how to organize the project, how to uh, streamline the processes, uh, how to do the, I don't know, the, the brainstorming sessions and et cetera. So these are all the things that actually helped us a great deal. And I would say you just need to understand your company and your needs at, at the beginning when you're approaching the publisher so that you can figure out when do you need them, why do you need them, and for how long do you need them. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, ultimately, I suppose that, uh, you know, in your particular case and the acquisition of uh, Madhead Games, working with certain publishers uh, definitely uh, play the role because I, I guess that you were recommended by, by, by your uh, publishing partners. Yeah, well, game industry is very, very small. So once you, you, you have uh, executed a deal successfully, and by that, I don't mean that you made, I mean, if you make a $100 million game, everyone's obviously going to know about you. But it's also it comes down to the confidence, right? Uh, if you executed like the project very well, but for some reason, publisher failed to sell it, you still did your part for really, really good. And this is going to be known because people are circulating around the company and everyone knows everyone else. And this is the very first question that I answered. So it's going to be known whether you are a, you know, a team in which someone can lay their confidence and or you're maybe less trustworthy. Okay. Thanks, Nenad. Uh, I would invite anybody for one or two uh, questions. That's uh, how much time we have today, unfortunately, but I'm sure there's going to be other occasions. So uh, maybe just turn on your camera and mic if you want to uh, hit Nenad up with, with a question. We can wait a couple of seconds. Huh. If there are okay. no questions, I'd just like to take a few seconds to praise you for I had a, a few days ago opportunity to watch the trailer for the Scars Above, I believe the game is called. I'm really glad someone from Serbia is taking the, the, the courage, it has the courage that takes to do the ambitious, like almost a triple A game. And I just wanted to say that that's a really huge inspiration for us. Right on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I am very glad that you like it. Thanks, Pavla. I hope we're going to have more stories like that in the coming months and years, of course, uh, from across the, the Serbian industry and the SGA's uh, membership. So, Nena, thanks a lot uh, for joining uh, us today. And uh, I'm sure we're going uh, to have people from your company also taking part in some of the other uh, modules from, from this program. So, it's really uh, super valuable uh, to, to hear uh, your experience. Uh, feel free to stay with us, and I'm going to move on to, uh, to Igor, Igor Simic from Demagogue Studio uh, from Belgrade. Um, Igor uh, is uh, also um, a, fine art, a fine artist uh, and um, uh, film director, but he has also entered the, the world of uh, game development. And Demagogue Studio uh, has one uh, game published uh, so far. Uh, it's called Golf Club Wasteland. And uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, it was picked up by uh, publisher Untold Tales uh, after its release. I hope I'm not saying anything wrong. So it's also an interesting, um, uh, let's say, scenario to, to hear about. So maybe Igor, similar to Nana, you could share your uh, take and your experience of your studio in this process from like, uh, why did this happen at that exact point of the development of the game, how it came to it and so on. Uh, thanks for the intro and uh, Nana, uh, feel free to jump in if I say anything stupid, you know much more about this than I do. 
Um, yeah, we signed, uh, actually this year, we are supposed to deliver two games. So we have two more deals with two publishers and uh, the whole pandemic was uh, just hell for me. Uh, so uh, what happened was uh, in um, 2018, uh, big, thanks to Apple, we got featured and published Golf Club Wasteland. And I was super happy with that, but my team was very unhappy because we didn't become millionaires. And uh, then the next year, um, we started making a prototype for a very ambitious game, which I was kind of on the fence about, but the team wanted a bigger budget project that would uh, justify them leaving their day jobs, basically. So we've done, a, uh, and I went to Reboot and there was one publisher that wanted to sign without a prototype. And given the complexity of the game, it would take us minimum half a year to do a proper product uh, demo. So um, against uh, kind of my wishes, we signed that deal. And uh, that deal uh, gave us a chance to start a company. So officially the company started existing. We had an office, people left their day jobs. So that was good news. However, I didn't really understand that what they are betting on is on us churning out something amazing within a couple of months because it's not in their interest to spend their own money, you see. What they want to do is to get a demo and then take it to so-called first parties, Sony, Xbox, et cetera. And then the first party says, oh, I know you, Michael, Nicholas, whatever the name of this uh, publisher uh, per contact person is, I trust this will happen. Here's a million. And then the publisher says, well, you guys ask for half a million. Here's half a million and we keep the rest for whatever and um, finish the game. But if they're not confident that they can make that shift of risk to a first party, then uh, they'll drop the project, which is what happened with us. And um, that was, uh, yeah, that was terrible. Everyone went down to minimum wage. Um, one person got very severely sick, um, not related to this, but just the whole timing was terrible. And uh, what happened afterwards was um, we just continued working on the demo. And this is the kind of key thing in terms of leadership and teamwork. One, we have an, uh, an amazing team where all of these people, no one really got severely angry with anyone. There was no judgment passed. It was just, okay, we go on. We are already in a better place than we were before. Everyone left their good paying but boring jobs. They have a sense that they're in a rock band, you know. So um, the then another thing was my part was, okay, I kind of not being a gamer, I never played games. I all of this happened while I took a step back, hoping that everyone else will take care of business and I'll just be the creative person. But since that, that, that didn't pan out really, uh, what we decided was I brought a game designer in and we used the same assets, the same world building, but uh, we changed the gameplay in one important aspect and it had a better flow. And uh, that was one move. So adding missing pieces, we simply didn't have game designers and level designers, which I guess is important in gaming. And uh, another thing that uh, I've decided was I need to kind of have at least two eggs in two baskets instead of just pumping years into one demo. So uh, we created uh, a kind of game on a scale that I wanted to do after Golf Club Wasteland, you see? So that was churned down in two months, the demo was done because it was a scale that was doable in that time span. And so what happened was now we have two demos 
And uh, in terms of sale selling, which means me talking, that's the only thing that we do very well, which means I always have a one sentence pitch. So um, the pitch for Golf Club Wasteland was um, desert golfing in Blade Runner. Uh, then the pitch for uh, this game, the smaller scope platformer is this is Jungle Book in Blade Runner. And when you have that one set, to, the hook, that's already, you see the people's reaction, that's already by and large enough uh, to grab their attention, that one sentence. Um, and then Stepco does amazing artwork. We usually, our decks have 10 to 15 pages. Per page, we have two sentences maximum. Um, and uh, the structure is usually uh, a log line or hook or pitch. Um, what is the game mechanic? Uh, what are comparable games? Um, what is the world building? Um, what is uh, the ask from the publisher in terms of budget, marketing, etc., uh, legal stuff? Who is on the team? Um, and that's pretty much the layout of, of the pitch deck. So we have that figured out. We have the demos. Uh, and another important thing is uh, Golf Club Wasteland already exists. So both games uh, are within the same intellectual property, meaning universe, what Rocco talk, talked about with metaverse, that type of mentality. So they have already a proof of concept that this works, we can deliver, et cetera. So what happened was because of Golf Club Wasteland, Nikola Chavich, who all you, know, you all know, he joined Demagogue Studio and we can use his contacts and reach out to publishers. So he would send 20 emails. Out of the 20 emails, maybe uh, 10, 12 people would uh, reply. Out of the 12, maybe six are very interested. And we go on calls with these maybe six publishers. And um, after some time you realize, okay, so these publishers are not willing to finance anything that is above 200K, while these other publishers are not interested in funding anything that is below a million. So um, that kind of middle ground is blurry. And um, yeah, so what happened was we discussed with several, some humongous, uh, publishers like world renowned names that are, you know, and some tiny, tiny publishers that's like um, artsy fartsy games. And uh, what, what ended up happening was Untold Tales at one point, because they just started uh, and they're all veterans within Poland, and it's all, you know, Pol Polish gaming scene is insane. So uh, they said, but you have already this game, Golf Club Wasteland. Why don't you do something else with it? And my thinking from the beginning, and that was the reason why Golf Club Wasteland was a premium game on mobile, was that's simply a stepping stone for us to do console and PC. And uh, they said, we will do the porting. Can you expand the game? It has to be over two hours of gameplay for Steam because of the return policy and blah, blah and expand the soundtrack. So we asked for some money for that. So suddenly everyone, you know, had their salaries increased, et cetera. And there is suddenly a kind of momentum. And immediately, um, so they suggested that after seeing two demos for something else, you see. So we signed that, but within working on that, they inquired about one of the two demos and they inquired about the smaller one because they didn't have money for the bigger one or it's too risky at their stage. And um, we signed the smaller one. We signed a demo that was a 3D demo. And then we said, but we'll actually want to do a 2D. 
but because they saw what we've done and that we always finish on time, et cetera, they said, okay. And now we are already like half into development of this game and it will be announced on March 24th. And um, also we will now pass by three months the development deadline, most likely. I hope this isn't going on YouTube because this shouldn't be public. Um, okay, so um, it might be useful, but we are doing it on our own dime because now we have other money sources. So they understand, oh, wow, this game will be a, of a much higher polish than they expected. So, uh, and it, it's probably the most important game in their portfolio for uh, first for all of 2023. It will come out probably beginning of 2023. So uh, that's the confidence thing. And then the other huge project. So there was a publisher that reached out to me three year, two years ago. And I immediately threw their email into the trash because whenever people reach out to you, you kind of gloss over it. You know, like when SGA writes to you. And I'm, I'm teasing. And uh, what happened was um, they saw that Golf Club Wasteland is coming out again. And they reached out again. So they weren't kind of whatever, uh, as Rocco mentioned, they weren't angry or anything. And I finally replied after almost sneering a deal signing with a big company from California, you see. And, but the big company for California wanted all of the games, which we couldn't do, and it was too risky for us. So we entered negotiations with these guys, and it sounded so weird because they would delay. Then suddenly they want to go on a call tomorrow. Suddenly it's super hurried. And I realized they have a first party deal almost in place huge, huge first party, which I can't mention. And I realized, oh, so they are stacking up these deals with gaming studios and selling that to the first party and massaging the first party saying, look at all of these amazing projects. So they're waiting for that to be signed. And that's why there's this dilly dallying. And that went on for three months. And I wasn't sure whether they were swindlers or what's going on. But finally, we signed with them. And it ended up being double the budget we asked for. So that's what uh, Rocco mentioned. The budget really depends. So with uh, Untold Tales, with whom we signed for the second game, we basically undersold us, understanding their financial situation, our financial the viability of the, and we decided, fine, we'll do it that way. In this case, uh, it will end up being realistic, even though they doubled, because the onus of porting, of, uh, of porting and of DLCs will fall on us. So in total, it will end up being realistic, you know? And that's pretty much the story. And uh, it's all a mess. And there was a great uh, article in Kotaku or somewhere about publishing where the guy just bashed everyone. Like uh, An Anapurna, uh, he were, talked to them. I was on LinkedIn with the CEO. He's now the top dog at Anapurna Film and Interactive. And he was, oh yeah, send it over and then just ghost you. Uh, it's like a bad Tinder thing. And then for the, um, there was another publisher super interested and then it all fell through uh, after four months of going back and forth and discussing the race of the main character. Um, then there was one uh, publisher I, I was very excited about and they, this is also funny, they said they were interested, but wanted to see one more level. And uh, we ended up signing, and then eight months later, hey, what's going on with that game? Well, we signed with someone else, but let's keep in touch. We're already working on a fourth game. So you keep in touch with people you, you like, I guess. So yeah, that's our uh, saga, our nightmare.
Thanks, Igor. Sounds really exciting. And uh, hopefully maybe someday it's a good material for, uh, you know, special Netflix documentary, <laughs> Serbian indie studio that... I, I yeah in the in the back of my mind stepko our art director wants me to write a script i don't know whether you i love the tv show atlanta with donald glover childish gambino yeah. and that's like about becoming a rapper so it would be interesting to do a show about you know bec- making it in gaming from there is one show kind of like that but in more of the Atlanta vein, that would be interesting, yeah. Or maybe how about a meta game, you know, a game about getting exactly. the publisher and so on, you know. Um, and so- then now, j- just so people understand uh, how quickly, if you have the goods in place, so in November, everyone was slightly above minimum wage and it was seven people. And now everyone is full paid in a competitive way in the market, uh, 20 people. So that's like not even like five months. Yeah. So, I mean, we are a bit running out of time. So I think we're going to skip questions if you don't mind. But I would have one like, would you say that for you, it was crucial to have this outside... uh, uh business support from 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 nicola and the others or like you know could you have been able to handle it on your own i i I suppose it's self-explanatory after the whole story but uh yeah this the short answer is no uh so i uh as i said uh i am a great salesman and nicola likes to push me forward as kind of the face But when it comes to numbers, to contracts, to understanding, oh, the rev share doesn't have to be 10 to 90. It can be maybe 60, 40 for us. Yeah. I mean, that's an actual example. So uh, if I did the negotiating regarding money, I would probably pay the publisher to publish us. Okay. So that's why we have uh, Nikolai, and in that sense, he was helpful. So, yeah. so you just made a good uh, ad for for the mentioned uh, workshop in April that we're going to do because Nikola Chavic will be running the workshop on, neg- on negotiation skills. So uh, yeah, everybody should uh, hold on for that. So thanks a lot, Igor. Uh, really amazing uh, story and amazing insights. Um, what we have, and of course, thanks to everybody for the patience, we have another hour uh, or so to go. So um, before we start, move on to the uh, mobile uh, part of the of the publishing world with uh, Vrinda and Nemanja, I'm just going to ask Adam uh, from Trilateral um, uh, Company from Serbia that is part of Epic Games, uh, just to use five to ten minutes of our time uh, to present the uh, uh, Epic Mega Grants uh, program because it's kind of falling between the cracks uh, of all of these uh, uh, modules. It's not really a publishing deal. It's not, of course, uh, public funding. It's not crowdfunding. So it's a program uh, started by uh, Epic Games and it's specifically for projects uh, that are working on Unreal uh, Engine. So Adam, thanks for uh, joining and the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Relia. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be really quick, uh, but in short, I really liked Igor's story, uh, very specific and also showing you that it's never a straight line to, to get to where you wanna go. Um, in terms of the Epic Mega Grants, uh, yeah, I, I've shortened down while we were speaking to basically one slide and it's the next one. Um, what this is, is as Reda mentioned, it's an opportunity for somebody that's working on Unreal Engine games or considering moving to Unreal Engine uh, to basically take advantage of grants that are no strings attached um, for creators, educators and uh, researchers. For today, we'll be focusing on creators, game developers in that sense. Um, well, what might be important to say that normally, well, we'll get to what amounts uh, are here and we we'll talk about specific, um, maybe amounts that are realistic for game developers. 
However, you shouldn't consider this uh, as um, substitutes for publishing. You can maybe more think about this as a way that you get towards that uh, vertical slice that Rocco mentioned, um, or like a demo uh, that you want to show. So um, in, in that regard, um, yes, uh, you, you can access it. Uh, Epic Mega Grants, we can post a link, uh, but we also have some links in the following slide. We like uh, uh, as well to keep things short. So a Google slide pitch, uh, here are some guidelines, eight to 20, 12 slides. I'm, I'm basically going through the do's and don'ts uh, rather fast, uh, focusing uh, on mostly visuals. So videos preferred, showing gameplay, showing the, the core loop uh, um, of, of your game. And that's, I would say maybe enough that you, you get this towards Epic Mega Grants. What's important is that this doesn't fly on ideas only, uh, but showing that you already invested some time and effort into getting um, something done. Uh, we do like and appreciate uh, sharing the ambitions and, and the fun of it. So you don't have to consider the team behind it uh, very serious, even though that that uh, it's uh, serious money behind it. Sharing your long-term long plans. So saying that, well, I'm at this stage uh, in the game and to get, let's say to alpha or to vertical slice, I would need X amount of money that being maybe 30, 40, 50,000, let's say that that being realistic. Um, uh, and then saying basically as Rocco and, and the rest of them uh, demoed, like having a specific plan and budget uh, uh, for getting there and to that next point. Um, in terms of budgets, we mentioned what can be realistic. Uh, Epic Mega Grants is not limited to that. It can go up to half a million in very, very limited and specific cases that need to be supported correctly. Uh, for this, we would recommend teams that basically think about uh, 20, 30, 40, 50K uh, while applying for Mega Grants and what you can do and it's recommended, you can use phases. So you can say, well, for phase one, I would, I'm, I'm thinking about an example that we had today, I would uh, complete the art for, for my game. Basically now I don't have any, but I would hire an artist and, and get that done, right? And that would cost uh, 20 or, or 25K. Uh, and for phase two, I would then upgrade, uh, uh, do a whole level or, or, or whatever. So, so that, that can be of use and uh, it leads us to the next, basically what if you don't get the grant the first time you pitch uh well you can apply again you can say well i did the the next steps and and this is what i created so that that's more than welcome uh, normally the team also provides you with some high level feedback on why you, uh, what you would need to to show more uh, to to get the grant and uh, on our end uh, the trilateral team here locally and maybe i should have started with that um, be, I'm myself, I'm supporting the, the ecosystem and growth, working with Relia and, and, and the rest uh, to see how we grow here locally and regionally. Um, so our team is quite open that if you send those pitches our way, uh, basically, yes, we would love to see what you guys are creating in Unreal Engine and, and how we can basically structure the pitch and uh, give feedback to it. Uh, closing off, one, one thing that can kind of push the pitch uh, towards winning is uh, if you create some value for the community, if there's some specific uh, tech in, in, in your development or plugins that you wanna show uh, that can be open for, for anyone later on or, or uh, maybe even developing like documentation or, or devlogs, that's amazing. So if you include that, it might increase your chance of winning, not cement it, of course. Um, so, so trying to keep this short and sweet uh, in the end, like what you can do, uh, we basically recently opened up this uh, web page on Trilateral's um, um, website as well for the community. There you can see basically a, a bit of uh, what the terms are and who can apply and uh, we're not closed off for game developers. If you're educators, there's also some a lot of specific examples of, of projects that, that, that we supported. Um, and uh, you're more than welcome to basically apply or 
get in touch with us through the, the web form there or like send emails to either of these and, and we'll reply within a day. Um, so yeah, that's like really in short, um, if, if Reda has any comments or questions that something I missed, again, in summary, like getting to publishers, not a replacement for publishers. Um, that's yeah. what I would say, yeah. Thanks a lot, Adam. I think it's super generous that you also shared your, your contacts and that everybody can kind of, uh, let's say, pre-apply with you and get uh, the uh, support directly from the source, so to say. And I think it's a big privilege for the uh, Serbian ecosystem, uh, of course, to have a company like Trilateral uh, here in Novi Sad, uh, uh, where, and I refer to the actual technology that you guys have been developing over the years. And then, of course, now uh, uh, as a proxy, also Epic Games is uh, very much uh, present, as well as Unreal Engine in Serbia. And there are many, many uh, nice plans to build things uh, in the future. So um, with saying this, I would round up the, uh, the, the PC core, however we call it, uh, part of today's program. I want to thank everybody for the patience and also to, to Nemanja and uh, Vrinda from, from Voodoo. So, we're going to move on to uh, their part uh, of the story. And uh, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Rinda, who is a publishing manager uh, at Voodoo. Uh, Voodoo is one of the best known hyper casual uh, developers and publishers, I would say globally, one of the 40 uh, most promising uh, French uh, tech uh, startups. And RGA has um, um, entered an, uh, a partnership with Voodoo in this year. And we're gonna, this is just the first, let's say, uh, small collaboration we are doing. And we hope to do uh, many, many more things um, uh, over uh, across the year. There's gonna be a hyper casual day uh, presented by SGA in June uh, together with Voodoo. And then we're also gonna offer some of our local developers a chance to visit um, uh, Paris probably and, and visit um, uh, Voodoo, um, you know, at their HQ. So uh, without further ado, Vrinda, uh, the floor is yours uh, for your presentation, uh, short and sweet, as you uh, said. And then, of course, everybody will have a chance to ask you questions. And then we're also going to talk to Nemanja um, uh, Divyak from Tami Games, a um, um, uh, developer from Serbia that is extensively working uh, with Voodoo on uh, publishing uh, their own hyper casual games. So thanks for being here today and the floor is yours. Of course, thank you. Uh, I, I think that talk about Paris got Nemanja super excited for some champagne. So <laughs> super, super happy to meet everyone. Uh, again, thank you for inviting us to speak at this event. Um, just a quick introduction. I'm Jinda. I'm one of the publishing managers in the Paris headquarters. I've been working with Tummy Games for about one and a half, two years now. I've been with Voodoo as well for about two years. Um, and I'm going to be talking commercials, the, the fun stuff. Um, I have a little presentation uh, ready for you guys. Uh, don't hesitate to, of course, you know, uh, step in if you think it's interesting to comment or share something. Um, so yeah, welcome again uh, to this session. Today, I'm gonna be talking publishing for studios, which is always a fun part. Um, to be super transparent, it's a huge Pandora's box. Um, I know that I was supposed to talk about the market and it's impossible for me to cover really fully the extent of the commercial offers that this entire market has to have, which is why I think it would be better for me to just speak a little bit about the umbrella sort of, you know, uh, options that you have as a studio and then talk a little bit more about how Voodoo uh, assesses these, uh, these many options. Um, so of course, you know, when you're navigating the market, you will come across a lot of different kind of commercial options for you as a studio. Um, we know, of course, you know, that um, for you guys to sustain yourselves, you have to look at not only short term, but also long term. Um, at the base, of course, is a publishing agreement. This is usually a long term uh, commercial agreement for you guys, where you're focused on the development of a game more from a 
post-launch or scaling phase of your game itself. But of course, getting there takes some time and some patience. And I'm sure Nemanja will have a lot to say about that in about uh, 10, 15 minutes, um, which is why, of course, you know, there are a lot of publishers out there, including us, that try to provide as much financial support as we can in the short run as well. So this, this could take form in maybe prototype payments. It could take form in monthly payments. Uh, it really depends from publisher to publisher what their priorities are. Um, and of course, finally, having new kinds of business models. So these are really created pretty much in real time, uh, of course, because hypercasual is such an evolving uh, market and we're consistently adapting to it as well. Uh, this also comes across also from the difference in the product itself that, you know, you see from something that was a hypercasual game in 2019 versus today. Um, so I'm going to dive a little bit about, you know, how Voodoo works specifically commercially. And of course, firstly, I want to start by saying we're very proud to be the number one games publisher worldwide. Um, and what's really important for us is that this is not only a reflection of um, big downloads, but also big payouts, uh, which, you know, feature kind of our success. Uh, we've been able to reach this point by really taking what we call a studio first approach. Um, how we do this is, of course, you know, keeping in mind that for studios, the priority, of course, is margin. You know, when you're putting in effort into a game for whatever, three months, six months, sometimes longer, depending on the genre and the type of the game, um, you want to be getting the best return on investment. This is why uh, we really believe being studio first is, you know, at the core of our business itself. Um, in order, of course, to, you know, be sustainable, you need to have a massive upside, which is why at Wudu we have quite flexible contracts, to be honest. Uh, we've had a lot of studios that come in maybe on a specific type of contract and then switch to another one or, you know, go from one kind to another as well. It really boils down to what your preference is in terms of security and safety and how much risk you're willing to take as well. Um, this is also, of course, you know, like I mentioned before, in addition to your financial support. So here we have the publishing agreement itself, which can go in a direction that you would deem fit uh, for smaller games. You know, certain security might be better. So maybe some upfront payments versus, you know, of course, some games where scaling might be on your side as well, in which case you might want to go classic kind of Russia, et cetera, as well. Um, I'm happy to discuss, you know, uh, these in the Q&A as well. I won't go too deep into it just yet. Another thing, of course, that's really important uh, and thinking of commercials is not glossing over product because the amount of value that your product has also for use of studio is super, super high. Um, what's again important to remember is that for this, you have to think of the return on investment in terms of your game. So we're talking KPIs, we're talking retentions, we're talking engagements, we're talking CPIs, we're talking scaling, uh, all of that stuff. And that is also something that, you know, we really, again, prioritize. What's cool about Voodoo is that we are an independent publisher. So for us, you know, we are not thinking about being on the charts also because we have the fortune of being, you know, a credible kind of uh, publisher on the market. We're not looking to be on the charts. We're not looking to be, um, you know, just getting your name on the top. Of course, if that happens organically, why not? Um, but what's important for us is that if we have to be a little bit low on the charts and that means better payouts for you guys, that's fine. Which is why we're also able to adapt to slightly more flexible KPIs. And I'll come to that in a minute in some of the case studies that I will go over. And of course, finally, um, sorry, I think someone wanted to add something or not. <laughs> and of course, finally, uh, the vision itself, um, you know, we're thinking also long term here. So we're not trying to just get you payouts or margins or returns on your game in the short run. We're trying to create, you know, the next Helix jump, Flappy Dunk, whatever it might be, so that you're not just paid now, but you're paid for the months to come for possibly the years to come. And that again, ties back to the product and the commercial offers that we have itself. So that's kind of the whole ecosystem that we have to create something that is, you know, soundproof, not just now, but also tomorrow. So what is it like working with Guru? Um, we actually are really doubling down on hyper casual. So again, to maximize your chance of getting returns on your game, we're not only thinking product in terms of the ideation phase. So, you know, ideation frameworks, coaching, benchmarking tools, whatever it might be, uh, but also gathering all the support that we can again to improve those KPIs in the prototype phase. So whether this is uh, something like a co-production offering, which again, I'll come to in the case studies, we have the opportunity for studios to collaborate on a game and, you know, 
allow a game to get across the finish line, which may or may not otherwise have uh, just on its own. Um, we also have, of course, collaborative game roadmaps, which means sometimes we have studios come in, step in, take a game, assess it, and share their feedback. Mm -hmm. They may be younger or newer studios. Um, I'm sure, you know, even like eventually, uh, Nemanja is going to be doing that for a lot of our studios uh, in Serbia. So yeah, we'll keep you posted on how that works as well. Um, of course, you know, like I said, also in terms of the launch phase itself, we're really doubling down on commercials. So having flexible launch KPIs, which means that we don't say yes or no to specific metrics anymore. This used to be the case maybe two, three years ago, but not so much anymore. Because one of the biggest things we've realized is if a game has potential, you find a way to make it work. And I will again come to that in some of the examples that I talk about. Apart from that, of course, we have a bunch of teams that will double down on the game with you. Um, and we have, you know, uh, on the scaling side of things as well, you have access to an Opti team, you have a post-launch dashboard, and of course, a multimedia, everything to the side. We also are looking to take that beyond hyper-casual. So, of course, this is your return in terms of a classic hyper-casual game, but we intend to take that even further. Um, this is, of course, optimization. So whether, I'm sorry, I think... Um, I think we have some uh, noise there. Um, oops. Yeah, sorry. Adam Kovac is uh, not, uh, he's muted. Now. My bad, sorry. Uh, of course. So yeah, as I was saying, we also have optimizations that come in. So we have our optimization team that comes in and takes care of your game, like I said, in the long term. We have partnerships with, you know, uh, platforms such as Snapchat, TikTok, again, which is uh, a platform that uh, Nicola um, Nemanja is working with, with Tummy Games. Uh, we are also looking at extending genres. So this one is probably the most interesting one. Uh, we're taking hyper casual games and trying to turn them into either some kind of multiplayer, some kind of casual, or even a hybridized version of itself. And of course, like I said, coming up with new business models alongside with studios to see what could actually work for them. So this is kind of more on a tailored approach. Um, for instance, we're hoping to, you know, do something cool with Tummy. I will not reveal too much too soon, but you guys will definitely hear about it. Um, I will just quickly talk about what some of these success stories look like commercially. Um, one of our biggest games actually from the year is probably Castle Storm. Uh, this is a great example of a co-production, which is that an original studio uh, sourced this, the idea and the essential core of the game, and a secondary studio then took over and converted that game itself. Um, so as you can see on the first iteration, you know, we knew CPI was sticky, and it kind of stuck despite multiple iterations over a couple of months. Uh, however, we weren't quite able to move the needle uh, on the retention itself. This is when we brought in Racket Spell um, that had you know, historically a lot of experience with, um, with puzzles and themselves with Dig This, et cetera. And they were able to convert you know, Castle into the huge success that it became eventually. Um, this is an example of how we were able to convert with Coprod. Another example is Collect em All. Uh, this is also one of our larger games from the previous year. Uh, here, you know, we had a first iteration where the CPI was, you know, not so great. It wasn't looking that good. D1 was 41. D7 was around 20% and playtime was around 35 minutes. Um, so normally a publisher would have probably just moved on from it looking at the CPI. But we knew there was something sticky there. Uh, which is why we were able to extract the mechanic and try to casualize the game itself. And that's how we came up with, you know, the version that you see uh, on the stores today, uh, which is doing quite well. We're not only looking at D7, but also D30 in terms of returns, which is incredible. And, you know, we still have the same hyper casual core with some meta features and some, you know, additional kind of, let's say, layers, which we borrowed from casual. And we were able to hybridize this model to make it work really well for the studio. And of course, a final case study, which I will let Nemanja uh, talk about in detail. This one is a pretty classic one, to be honest. Here, of course, you know, all the credit goes to Nemanja and the team for coming up with an idea that was great. I think this is a good example of a great collaboration. Uh, I believe it was Corentin, one of the other publishing managers who had been digging through kind of, you know, our stats and saw that a game like uh, Flappy Dunk still had a very high D7. We sourced this, uh, of course, to, to Tummy Games. And this is how they 2021 ified it. A great way to, you know, take something trendy like, uh, you know, ASMR slide 
slicing or like a hot knife slicing, et cetera. Uh, from day one, you can see, you know, we had stats that were pretty launchable, uh, but us being sticklers, we were like, you know, we can definitely increase the window uh, that we can work with on this game by pushing CPI a little bit further. So much to Tami's uh, agitation, we took a little bit longer than we should have, but we were able to optimize CPI quite well um, through some simple hacks. So just adding things, you know, on the product side that made the game juicier, we were able to bring down the CPI from around 27 cents to 18 cents. Uh, again, props to props to Nemanja and the team for, you know, such a great success. Nicola. Um, and to Nicola, of course. Uh, <laughs> is he on the call as well? Uh, no, no, yeah. he's not. But he, right. he, he's the genius behind this he, one. You, you guys all are. <laughs> Which is, so this one was a little bit more classic, you know, we were able to just look at the KPIs and convert this into a much bigger game than it would have been uh, because of the window between uh, CPI and retention expanding a little bit. So just to kind of like briefly conclude on the commercial front, you know, we think that it's important to see what works in a game and what doesn't work in a game, tie that up with your contract. And of course, you know, push the game as much as we can on whatever front that works. So again, like Voodoo takes something of a hybrid approach, let's say to, to publishing itself, we will see what works and what doesn't work. So key takeaways for you guys, um, what we've learned in 2021 in terms of the games themselves, uh, of course, that should not be there. All right, sorry, it's a little bit cut, but what we've learned in terms of 2021 is that there is no game that cannot be a hyper casual game. We have everything from classic kind of, you know, runners that are binary, do something like Castle, do something like Bounce and Collect, do something like Lumberjack. And that's what we really want you guys to focus on. Your best commercial will come from innovation at the end of it. Um, so what you can use to actually bring your games to publishers is focusing on products. So of course, engagement and marketability, these are increasingly important because CPI is getting harder and harder to control, which is why focusing on depth and on how, how you're able to retain your users is really crucial. And of course, in terms of you guys, what you would be really, really good at working on is mindset and ideation. Uh, when I say mindset, you know, this is your ability to look at data, your ability to move quickly and really trying to double down on what works and what doesn't work. And of course, using that in your ideation process consistently. And that's it for me. I don't know if you guys have any specific questions um, and of course, otherwise passing the mic to Nemanja. Or maybe I should join also if somebody has questions. Thanks for that. Uh, really, really insightful. Uh, maybe be, before we see, I mean, we can move on to the, let's say the Q&A part. I would just like to ask Nemanja, uh, before we, uh, we start, if you could share a bit of your experience, of course, a bit of background uh, on Tami Games and how did you come into the uh, opportunity to work with Voodoo? So, because we were talking also in the first part of the, of the session today, uh, what are these different scenarios? How do you come into contact with the publisher? How do you, you know, successfully pitch? Or is it personal contacts, recommendations, meetings at events and so on? So what was the story in this case? So as our previous uh, panelist or uh, speaker said, uh, I was also at a Reboot conference. I think it was 2018. Uh, I met, I, I first time saw about uh, option about publishers at that point I didn't know uh, much about hyper casual publishing and so on so we uh, started talking with one of the uh, publishers back then uh, we tested one of the games but that didn't go through uh, and then what happened is I actually reached out uh, and sent 41 email I specifically know there was 41 publishers uh, and one of them who responded was Voodoo uh, and they sent us a contract that was very scary. So initially, uh, as Vrinda said, the contracts have changed. Uh, just to give a comment, we changed probably six or seven contracts with Voodoo uh, so far. So things are constantly evolving as we are evolving also. Uh, but initially, we decided they had, uh, to go with them. We started working. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, initially, it was all about uh, us funding the game development, right? Uh, and after a few months, Voodoo saw that we are still trying, we are working, and then they offered us kind of payment per, per prototype. Uh, so that was the key moment when we were able to start working on our own games, uh, focusing mostly on them. 
Uh, and then uh, in the total 11th game was our first hit called Volley Beans. Uh, and then things changed a bit when some amount of money came in. Uh, and we continued working with Voodoo. Uh, we tested some other publishers also. So uh, for full disclosure, Voodoo was not just the only one who we worked with. Uh, we made a second hit with another publisher. Uh, then we started, we continue working constantly with uh, Rinda uh, and Voodoo exclusively. Uh, but after, I, th I think there was probably 20 failed prototypes. Uh, we finally got to slice it all. Uh, and slice it all was published as one of the hit games. Luckily for us, uh, in the middle of 2020, uh, Apple announced Apple Arcade program. So we signed one of the games that Voodoo didn't take because the numbers were not good and it was hyper a hyper casual game, we made hybrid casual game. So in the end, we kind of repurposed one of the failed builds. We signed the deal with Apple and we launched the game on Apple Arcade, but we never gave up on uh, hyper casual and we are still working with them. We expanded our team. Uh, there is 13 people right now in Tummy Games working on hyper casual games. Uh, and yeah, uh, we have decided basically last year to kind of go uh, all in with Voodoo. Uh, and uh, we are expanding that collaboration, but uh, I will add a little bit more information later. Okay, cool. And could you tell me uh, in those 41 emails, what was like the, the content of that, I guess, one email that you drafted? Did you send any uh, prototype yeah, concept uh, document or? Yeah, we had uh, built uh, a prototype game. So we already have had the game. So I basically had uh, APK, I, ha uh, I think it was a link to Google Play, there was video, uh, and literally that was it. Uh, I, I think we only had some metrics uh, that we tested that we knew, uh, but uh, not, not many publishers were interested. Uh, most of them kind of uh, went into uh, uh, casual space or PC gaming. Uh, but uh, what I can say, we worked with uh, almost all hyper casual publishers in some extent we either tested the games with them uh, but um, everybody has different approach uh, and how they test but uh, for us uh, somehow working with voodoo kind of ended up the optimal way and we got the most out of everything and as i always say uh, sorry for my language voodoo was the only one who had balls to invest in our uh, development so everybody was always uh, kind of trying a way to uh, mingle out of the uh, paying us or lowering the amount of money. You know, we have four or five people and they say, okay, we'll give you $2,500 to pay all the salaries. And it was kind of impossible to do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, continuing, continuing working with Voodoo kind of made sense. Okay. Great. So could you uh, tell us from your point of view, from your end, how does the process now uh, look like, like the, 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 the pipeline? I mean, you don't need to go, of course, into any specific yeah, yeah. of the business deal, but just like what is the, the pipeline? Well, in a nutshell, Vrinda, Nicola, myself and Theo uh, meet every single week, same time to discuss ideas. We spend 30, 40, 50 minutes, depending on the day. We discuss about the ideas, what is trending, what can be done, uh, or we discuss one of the prototypes that we have. Uh, in most cases, we have something that we figured out or they saw something on the market that is working. They advise us, hey, this might be a good direction. Uh, we show them what we think might be a good direction uh, and we continue developing the game. Uh, usually there is one developer and one designer working on games uh, and we kind of focus on uh, pushing uh, one or two prototypes one or two prototypes per month now. Uh, initially, that was much faster, but right now we are kind of working on one or two. But uh, I think that we were in the can confirm, we usually have at least five or six prototypes in pipeline, but we're jumping from one to another, but it's constantly uh, being worked or we're going back to something when it makes sense. Some of the games that uh, kind of we tested six months ago, we check uh, uh, analytical data and we see that actually that game is performing better than it was performing in the past. Sometimes we do retest the CPI, so we start working again on a game. But uh, in essence, we have weekly calls, we talk with them, we discuss ideas, and we build out the prototypes. Uh, and what, what I want to say is the biggest value that we got from Voodoo, it's not the money, it's the process. 
So uh, I'm hearing all the developers in Serbia constantly working six months, eight months, a year on a game. F that. That does not work. Even for AAA game, you can make it uh, within three weeks. All the assets exist on the asset store. So you don't have to build 3D models. You don't need to build animations. You just need to pick up the models, pick up the level, make a playable story that can be repeatable. Uh, and that's it, just test it, get initial data. That's what we learned from Voodoo. Fail fast, test fast, iterate fast, and hopefully publish fast. <laughs> and okay. yeah, they, they publish fast. So yeah. when the game is launched, it goes into millions uh, within a month. So I mean, millions of users. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Rinda, on, on your end, uh, are you, if we talk about analytics, uh, have you been building your own tools uh, or you're using um, um, tools developed by other companies, uh, services, and so on? Absolutely. So we do have some internal tools as well, and we have some external ones. So in the testing phase, we really stick to kind of the classic uh, Facebook, uh, GA, Snapchat, etc. Uh, whereas it a post launch phase, we do have an internal tool to read more, uh, especially for the studios. I think this is really crucial. We have full transparency in a post launch dashboard, which allows studios to track alongside with us kind of how the CPI is evolving, what is the game looking like. Uh, we also have an internal tool which studios don't have access to yet but we hope to roll it out eventually which allows us to also read a b tests etc uh, on our own platform uh, this is of course based off of ltv uh, based off of you know more the 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 let's say product side of things as opposed to the um, cpi ua etc um, we also have of course an internal data analytics team which is uh, watching all the metrics quite closely for this so yeah we have a combination of tools Okay, and when it goes out to building new collaborations with uh, with the studios, um, so do you get approached a lot, or do you also have people on your team that basically scout and reach out to studios? Uh, so, or it's a balance of the two because, like in the you know in the independent music industry, for example. Uh, quite quite a long time ago, I, I was at a label uh, office in in Austria, and there was like a huge box of CDs, you know, under the desk. And I was like, "So what are these?" And and uh, the guy was like, "Oh yeah, that's all the demos we got uh, in the last year. You know, there must be some amazing music there, but there's nobody who's you know gonna has time to check it out." So. Well, you don't have to like it in the in the you know world of uh, mobile game publishing. You don't have to worry about that so much with us. Um, we we do have, of course, you know, a lot of a lot of requests sent over, whether it's on LinkedIn or email. Um, but we we scan each one uh, diligently. Um, if you guys have something promising, whether it's a prototype, if you have the right mindset, uh, we just need to find a way to collaborate together. Of course, you know, for me to say that we work with all studios would be a lie as well. Uh, it really boils down to which studio has the same vision as us in terms of prototyping, uh, which studio has the same objective in terms of getting a hit, and of course, you know, which studio has a skill set that is meeting those as well. Um, we do, of course, also have. Well, we all play a hundred games a day. Literally, I'm on I'm on the app store in the morning, you know, downloading everything that's new or looks cool. Um, so I have, you know, often reached out to studios by myself as well. Um, but this is, of course, a little bit more rare. Um, we do have also a business development team that is, again, scanning the stores consistently and reaching out to studios that we think have promised. Uh, sometimes this works out really well. Oftentimes, you know, these studios might be working with another publisher, but we've often found them come back to us in some way. So we can't complain. <laughs> like, like Tommy. <laughs> Well, it definitely sounds like you're you're on a on a good track, you know. If we hear it from 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 both perspectives, so I would I mean, uh, unless you guys would like to share uh, some some uh, more insights, I would also like to open open the floor, of course, to questions uh, from uh, participants. I, I'm not I wanted sure. to say something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'll share just limited data because you just talked about scouting the teams. Uh, there is a uh, work in progress with Voodoo at this point uh, for a potential program that's going to happen in Serbia in Novi Sad, where developers will have a three to six months program and ability to learn how to make hypercash games, both from us and from Voodoo team. Uh, and also 
uh, test games. So go to the full process with us and with Voodoo. Uh, and on top of that, uh, if they prove their worth and they want to continue working, uh, even potential to get paid to continue working on games uh, with the potential to have a contract with Voodoo and so on. So that's something that is happening right now. Uh, we don't have 100% all the data. So SJ will be first to know when we announce the news, but this is kind of uh, before the news, the news. Okay, great. That sounds really exciting, especially with Novi Sad, uh, you know, becoming such a, um, a hub for, uh, for game dev in Serbia. I mean, I cannot, you know, we're going to wait for our next um, annual industry report that we are basically scraping the da data for uh, this month and it's going to be published on April 1st. So it will be interesting to see, you know, the uh, balance between uh, Belgrade and Novi Sad because uh, it seems to me that Novi Sad is also uh, catching up uh, quite a bit. And of course, from the side of SGA, um, throughout this year and um, our future programs and activities, we're going to pay attention to both uh, niche and Novi Sad, but also some uh, smaller uh, smaller communities um, uh, across uh, Serbia. Uh, thanks, Nemanja, for sharing kind of exclusively this uh, information with us. So, uh, Pavle turned on his camera. I guess there's a question coming. I just want to say I'm not sure how many mobile uh, developers um, uh, we have um, in attendance, but um, uh, hopefully there are some. So, Pavle, go ahead. Yep. So, I have no firsthand experience with uh, publishing and making hyper casual games. However, we are looking into it. And what I did have an experience with was this awesome channel on YouTube called Serbian Games Association and uh, a very informational video where at which a representative of Tummy Games was there. So how to make and publish hyper casual phenomenons. And from that, I took two interesting things for me myself, because I'm more in the management than the de development part is the first thing that goes into the hyper casual games is like agile and hyper prototyping and the other thing is like agile and hyper scraping of trends and looking into tiktok instagram and stuff like that so my question comes to that ideation point so at which point do we see an interesting trend or something like that and say i think that that is a good game do we just again try and try and until we find something or are there certain trends and certain things that we see building and say that's an awesome thing to to turn into a game um th thanks for the question i think that's really the most interesting one because tiktok has become such a huge part of our lives uh, here at hyper casual uh, i think what's really what's really interesting about trends is that there's actually two ways to approach it uh, one is that you you know are the first to pop onto a trend um think something like squid games we had like a million squid games games come out when uh, when you know the show went viral versus looking at something that is working in terms of a game feeling on you know, TikTok or something along those lines. Uh, for instance, I think a game that did this really well was probably High Heels. Um, you know, they tapped into this like uh, subculture of baddies on on TikTok and you know converted that into a game. And I think that's that's genius. Um, similarly, something like Slice It All, you know, was picking up on something that had existed on YouTube for such a long time uh, and and was able to extract the feeling and link that with a gameplay and with a mechanic that. You know, kind of, it's like it, it goes back and forth, right? The toy supports the mechanic and the gameplay, and the gameplay and the mechanic supports the toy. Um, so, what's important is looking at trends more, in my opinion, to make a strong game, more from a toy perspective or a game feeling perspective, rather than just watching a video and trying to make a game out of it. Um, so, that would be the key takeaway for me. Uh, don't watch a video because we, we have a lot of studios that do that. You know, they see a video and they literally just try to gamify it, which doesn't work. You have to understand why it's viral or why it's working. Um, there's a lot of, again, TikTok games about transformation. And, you know, you have these like glow ups and you have makeup stuff, et cetera. And that was actually converted into, in a sense, you know, all these cool games that we saw around, you know, um, whether it's transformation on Destiny run from good to bad. So you can go as good or as bad as you want. 
or you know something like uh, like even makeup run or shoes etc where you have this like physical transformation of the of the character so look at the tiktok trend try to extract a mechanic out of it or a game feeling and that that is a good way to work i don't know what you think um nemanya since you guys yeah, uh, did uh, the starting well uh, as you mentioned slice it all also came in from the cutting uh, feeling on a youtube uh, pancake card the game that we did was also the trend on youtube that was getting like 100 millions uh, of views uh, people drawing pancakes uh, with the colors so yes i can say we definitely did tap into uh, two times into the uh, feeling of the videos but that was not the uh, main goal to kind of clone it uh, the idea is that we are always looking about the uh, looking videos looking ideas looking what's trending uh, but we still try to figure out uh, to make something fun so it's not just okay, th this is, let's clone it, but uh, there is a process. We always talk about the ideas. Uh, uh, also, as Rinda said, we do follow what is trending. We try to test something, but it does not always work. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, we stick to one mechanic. We tested five, six, seven different versions, uh, and then we move on to something else. We tested puzzles, uh, similar kind of mechanics on a puzzles like 20 times, and every single one failed. And we said, okay, let's move to runners. So uh, you, you never know what's going to work, but uh, yeah, you, ha you have to follow the trends, uh, but you don't specifically have to clone them. Uh, one of the trends that I ha we have seen uh, last year, and we also talked with Rinda, uh, I don't know who played on Nintendo, uh, Mario, uh, I, I think it's Superstar, uh, and it has like 100 mini games. Uh, I, I think that at least five or six voodoo hits last year uh, or in the past two years were from that game. Like uh, Knock'em All was definitely 100% clone or out of uh, Mario, but changed. So it, it wasn't like one-on-one, -on -one, but it was the same mechanic, the same core mechanic was used to create that game and a uh, uh, few others. Uh, and on top of that, as Brinda said, we are also looking what others are working on. Uh, I, I think that uh, we had at least three or four of our games becoming hits of other studios. Uh, they saw the idea and they iterated on it. They cloned it, uh, mm -hmm. made it better. Uh, Rinda knows we had a game called Glue It. It was a three-step game that uh, you basically kind of build a vase, you color it, uh, you dip it into the water and you put effects and you get, get different color uh, of ways with the flowers, you know. And then the one of the teams made a tie-dye game where you do the same process but with a t-shirt. <laughs> so and that game uh, came after hours so uh, everybody's scanning everyone but it's really hard to nail the hit <clears throat> i can and i can tell you we build 10 20 games before we get a hit so the idea is basically to fail as fast as you can until you get the, to the one that's going to work um, and it's not 100 guaranteed but it's almost uh, kind of impossible to get there it's the uh, game of numbers so if you continuously try and try and try, you will find something that will have all the numbers. And we usually have the games that has, for example, uh, day one is perfect, day seven is perfect, playtime is perfect, but the CPI is problem or the vice versa. We have the CPI, but the day one and day seven are bad. So you, you, you kind of have to try to get it. And actually Volleybeans was the game that had uh, 20 cent CPI uh, and it had uh, initially 25% day one. But with an iteration, it went to 58% day one. So you, you have to test the idea. And that's yeah. why Voodoo is there to help us mm -hmm. go to those processes and test and test and test. And every single call, we discuss how we can make something better. So even if we test the idea, there is almost uh, immediate feedback. Hey, we can improve it on this if, there is, if it makes sense. So sorry for moving away from the initial no, question. That's fine. Yeah. Thanks, Nemanja. Sorry, Pablo. I just need to mention that we have Rinda around for maybe only a couple of more minutes. So I just wanted to ask if anybody else has a question specifically for her, and then Nemanja uh, can stick with us for a couple of more minutes um, uh, for some more Q&A. So if there's anybody else who would like to uh, ask, use the chance to ask Rinda a direct question, please. Use the chance now. 
or forever hold your peace. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> or if not, uh, we can really uh, thank you uh, so much for uh, for being with us today. And maybe we're going to see you in uh, Serbia at some point this year, or definitely. <clears throat> yes, you will. Yeah, when we manage to to visit um, to visit France and bring some of the uh, Serbian developers. Uh, over there. So it's really um, um, kind of a pleasure to be able to, when we talk about hyper casual games, to, uh, to be collaborating with the, you know, number one um, uh, publisher, number one company in the field. So we are really looking forward to what's uh, ahead. Thank you so much. And of course, again, you know, we're number one because of the studios. So hopefully we'll be working with all of you guys very soon. Um, otherwise, of course, you know, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm leaving you in good hands. I'm sure Namanya is going to just do fine without me. So yeah, if, if needed, don't hesitate to reach out on my email as well or LinkedIn if you guys have questions. Um, thank you so much. Of course, it yeah. was a pleasure. So, uh, Pavle, if you wanted to follow up on uh, with Nemanja, uh, feel feel free. Go ahead now. Yeah. So, just to 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 close up the thing, don't just go step on the hype train, but try to understand the essence of something and why it went viral, and see that it it is game gamifiable, basically, right? Yeah, as you said, it, it's not easy. Uh, to make it so you you have to try uh, also the question is also the execution execution speed uh, what voodoo, voodoo is also constantly having problems is uh, teams not having enough experience mm -hmm. uh, and uh, making poor gameplays or poor games with a good mechanic uh, and then some of those games get moved to other studios for example uh, we worked on two or three games uh, none of them got published unfortunately uh, we actually worked on Collect Them All also. We had our own version, uh, but it didn't perform better than theirs. Uh, and one of the things that we didn't mention is also the support after the game launch. So one of the things that happened for us for Slice It All is there is a completely independent team that took over the game. So we worked on a game for about three months. We did uh, four or five updates, mm -hmm. but after that, there was like 50 updates that Voodoo did. Mm -hmm. So their internal team took over the game and they kept working on every single metric, improving it uh, by a percent and by percent by percent. Uh, and I think that the game right now uh, is completely different in US, on iOS and Android, in Japan. So you can play completely two different games with different uh, level lands or different uh, color schemes or different sounds. Uh, not even us uh, now know how exactly the game looks where, uh, but that is the power of a publisher uh, when they know about the numbers and data analysis and everything, so we don't have to think about, and we just move back into developing games again. Awesome. I think that's something like the whole gaming industry can look up to, not just the hyper casual space, like the networking that Pluto provides and the rapid prototyping that hyper casual that comes with hyper casual instead of falling in love with the game and doing it for two years before showing it to anyone. Yeah, a lot of developers who apply for a job to us, uh, all of them have uh, some kind of prototype that, never, that they never finished. Uh, and they were stuck with the game for two or three years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm seeing that uh, so many times. Uh, and I know that the biggest problem for people is to let go of the idea. So if you can't build something uh, within two or three weeks, stop, move to the next. Uh, I, will, I had COVID uh in january so i was sitting in my apartment and within two days i made a game so that, that that's the point you know when mm -hmm. there's a hackathon you build a game in three days yeah but when game, there is a hackathon awesome uh, th there is a meme on it uh you, you need like three months or three years to develop a game yeah. why you know <laughs> you, you overthink uh j yep. just to give an example our games don't have sound our games don't have settings. Our games don't have any additional stuff. Just a player, uh, one character, level, usually randomized levels, uh, and a sticky mechanic. That's it. You know, you only need that to test. So that's the mm -hmm. main point. Test the game, test the idea. If that works, you iterate again. If that works, you iterate again. If it doesn't work, you kill the game and move on to the next idea. And that's the biggest problem in a uh, complete uh, startup uh, environment. It's not just about the gaming. I'm seeing so many founders stuck on a 
a business idea that is not going anywhere, uh, afraid to kill it because it's their life, their heart. Uh, but you have to kill the game sometimes. Even the Meth Head games uh, had a problem with one of the games they did uh, that finally kind of ended. Uh, they invest like two years. If, if I'm not wrong, I think that the game is similar like a Diablo. I think that game in, in the end got killed. Uh, but the point is uh, fast testing, fast testing. It doesn't have to be the perfect, no matter what you're making. So even if we, for example, decided to go into AAA game, I can guarantee you that the AAA game game would be ready within uh, three months just for test. And if it worked and it had solid numbers, we would keep working on it or we would kill it. But some studios uh, like uh, Take Two Interactive, GTA V, they build it for like five years and they they release. Uh, and everybody has some kind of soft launches, soft test, blah, blah. But the point is you have to test fast, iterate and move on. Thanks, Nemanja. Well, basically, I mean, that is also why we split kind of this uh, first module into, you know, the mobile and the, let's say the core world. Um, I mean, in uh, Serbia, as most of you know, it's around uh, uh, 40% on, let's say, both sides. And then the 20% is made up of uh, uh, web uh, games and so on. Uh, so it's definitely two different uh, logics. And it's very interesting to hear about uh, hyper casual because it seems that it's very much embedded into the zeitgeist, into the basically the contemporary culture of the, you know, mostly, uh, I guess, predominantly uh, young players. So maybe th that would be my final question. And then maybe if there's another one, we can do another one and we should be wrapping up basically in the next five minutes. Uh, so what is basically the, what are the target groups, uh, the main target groups mostly for uh, games uh, developed by Tommy Games and, and Voodoo? Is it kind of, um, is there a huge span depending on the, on the, on the topic of the game or it's uh, more or less a similar target group? Uh, for, for the target group, the idea is for game to be playable by everyone. So usually being able to target everyone between 13 and 65 years who wants to play the games. Uh, but uh, we noticed immediately if the game is going to be hit or not, if there are more female players. So that's one of the key things. Uh, but uh, on our side, we never um, technically knew or focused on any uh, gender specific uh, uh, stuff. Uh, usually our goal is to make the game that is the best and uh, as playable as it can be for everyone. So when we start testing the games, uh, for example, on Facebook, you start seeing uh, what are the age, uh, age, mar age group, you can see the gender, male, female, or uh, something else that is uh, on Facebook. But the point is we try to build games uh, that I, I think it said agnostic to everything, you know? Uh, so everybody can play, everybody can lit, uh, relate to it. Uh, for example, uh, in Slice It All, it was not our intention. We made ra rainbow uh, stack. It got picked up by LGBTQ uh, community, so they started sharing the game. But that was not uh, our intention. For uh, Farm It, we released the game with uh, uh, white and black character uh, with one skin tone. And we got huge hate from people because they can't adjust the brightness of their skin, whether it's black, you know, somebody who is black, he wants it to be uh, more whitish or more dark, you know, and we ended up in those wars. So that's why we try in hyper casual to make the game as clean as possible without any focus on uh, somebody uh, being able to kind of relate. Uh, I know that Voodoo also had problems with the games where they got hate uh, from uh, unfortunately bigger females uh, because uh, in their game uh, th there was a uh, fact where you get fat or fit uh, and it caused the rage uh, from certain communities so the best thing is to be able to target everyone uh, we don't try to focus on specific but one of the things that uh, Vrinda mentioned I think that probably everybody missed is uh, the idea starts uh, building a game uh, as a baby, you know, the baby uh, step and baby mentality, you know, if the baby can play it or a kid can connect or understand it immediately, 
And if it works in a kid's world, it will work in an adult world. Uh, so it's really hard to make games as simple as they can. And one of the things is that we are constantly talk talking about is uh, the game has to have like one tap uh, or swipe. That's it. If you add additional complexity, it will not work in this case. And you can apply that also on casual games. Uh, the difference for casual games uh, is uh, you test them a uh, month or two months after the development. So the prototype phase is a little bit longer. Uh, we test casual games. We test the hybrid casual games. So we are working on that front also. Uh, but the development cycles are a little bit bigger and you get completely different demographics. Then you can include some additional features and meta and everything. But when you talk about hybrid, hybrid casuals, the simple is the best. As simple as you can, and that's it. Yeah, if you look their game, Helix Jump, it's swipe left and right. Slice it all, just tap. Uh, Flappy Bird, just a tap. So if you can create a core mechanic, which can be understood by everybody, uh, even you know your grandma being able to play the game, that's it. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we didn't uh, say, uh, basically within when we test uh, the games, within five seconds, the player must understand everything. How to play, how to die, how to win. So those are the key things. Uh, and that's something that, uh, as I mentioned, together with Voodoo, we are going to uh, expand in our region uh, and start teaching people on how to do that. Uh, but more info, info when everything is finalized. So... It's 99.9% .9 finalized, so. Great, sounds super good. So I think we're gonna be wrapping it up unless somebody uh, really wants to do one final question. Uh, but I guess everybody's already uh, pretty tired. I think we had a really amazing uh, session, marathon session, two and a half hours. So a really good start for Game Funding Bootcamp. Uh, we're going to be continuing in two weeks' time. So Tuesday, 22nd uh, of February, we're going to focus on public uh, funds uh, and EU funds. So in any case, public funds uh, that are available for uh, game developers and uh, associated um, uh, services and projects. So one of the sessions will be um, focused on uh, EU uh, run programs and uh, funds and we're going to run it in English and then we're going to have another session with a focus on the Serbian uh, state funds and other let's say incentives that are available for startup companies including uh, gaming companies you can already find uh, information about this uh, forthcoming program on uh, the SGA's uh, website sga.rs so uh, feel free to uh, apply, guys, and we're going to be announcing each next uh, module of the Game Funding Bootcamp uh, separately, so you can uh, watch our website and our social media, of course, for all of the um, upcoming events. And uh, what else to say? Thanks a lot for the patience and the energy and to all the uh, present presenters and speakers. And I wish you a really great uh, evening and the rest of the week. So see you soon.